They've been screwing around trying to fix it. How you doing, Ruth? How you doing? You look well, looking well as always. That's not gonna be a problem. <laughs> it was chicken uh, on my time. And, um, no, it won't. That won't happen. Mac and cheese, which was. Awesome. How are you? Um, and green beans and salad. How are you? Yeah. So good to see you. Me too. I'm great. I'll be great already. Hello. How are you tonight? Good to see you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Fine. I mean, Bill's gonna handle that. Um, so. I have. I, I told him that you you were you were going to be asking for additional time. In fact, I forwarded him your your letter this morning, so he's aware of it. Okay. Hi, Jillian. Hi. I'm so glad. I should have just said I should have just said just go, just go. I put some in the fridge for later too. I didn't need to explain it. I should have just said go. Well, but if you had been, if you had said something I didn't want, then I would have just driven a little Trust bit. Trust me, I know you wanted that. I know you wanted that. <laughs> it's awesome. Of course you don't want that. Did you get some of the mac and cheese, by the way? Who yeah. are the, uh... I've got it. I, I hit that twice. Yeah. What are the okay. green stickers? No, not really. Worth the bid. Ah, I just did. I hit it. Okay. That's the last of That's not good. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order Tuesday, September the 5th at 7 o'clock p.m. and certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. If we could just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. I asked the clerk if she would. Thank you, now I recognize Eddie Davis. <coughs> May we rise? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I ask the clerk if you would call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. President Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Moffitt. Here. Council Member Reese. Here. And Council Member Shul. Here. several proclamations to do this evening, but uh, first I would like to acknowledge a very honorable visitor with us today. As many of you may or may not know, Durham is the sister cities for many cities across the nation, uh, one of which is Arusha, Tanzania. And tonight we're fortunate to have the mayor, Arusha, Tanzania, visiting us. Uh, he's here for a week. We have a lot of activities planned, but I would ask Mayor Bukai if you would join me, either that roster over there, over here, uh, for any comments that you might have. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kalisti Lazaro Buhai. I'm the mayor of Arusha City Council, Tanzania, East Africa. And I arrived here Saturday evening. So, His Lordship Mayor, 
Ladies and gentlemen, greetings at large from the United Republic of Tanzania. Warm greeting from the city of Arusha. I'm very happy and feel honored to be with you today. For those who are not very familiar with the geography of Africa, especially Tanzania, I'm from Tanzania, as I explained, which is the famous, the land of Kilimanjaro and Zanzibar Island. And my city is between Cape Town, South Africa, and the city of Cairo, that's Misri. Uh, that is our history, and if you come to Arusha, one of our monuments in the city is short the distance from the Cairo and the Cape Town in South Africa. So for this, then I will say from the beginning, you need to see that center of Africa, that's Arusha. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Mayor, economically Arusha is a strong city. I think even the Daham is a strong city. Since I came here, I've seen a lot. <coughs> and Arusha is host of more than 13 international institutions that are based in Arusha. I can name few. One is Arusha International Conference Center. East African community is based in Arusha City. We have an institution of Pan-African Post Union based also in Arusha. We have Nelson Mandela University of Agriculture. We have a Monduli military that comprises a lot of uh, academics, uh, military academicians from different countries in the world. We have African court that are based in Arusha also. Regional Health Secretary, East and Central African Management Institute, ICTR, Arusha used to be, uh, ICTR is an international criminal uh, tribunal court that was based especially for the Rwandan criminal issues. The famous Serengeti National Park is a gateway, Gorongoro Crater, Kilimanjaro Airport, if you want to arrive in Arusha. We have Aga Khan University College. These are just a few. All these couple with, which is well connected with the network of roads, railway, and airport. This make Arusha City to be a center of economic activities. This being the case, a lot need to be done to cope with this uh, international situation. Situation analysis, just to mention few. Guided as, um, as am, I, am I and going through the structure of our government budget and what the city can collect from its own source, one can easily conclude that a lot need to be done to cover the gap. It is on the strength of all these basic facts that's why we need and have taken trouble to to present to you the structure, the structure of our budget, of our council budget, our commitment, our vision, our mission statement. This have enabled us to conclude that a lot to be done, but also we are hopefully and optimistic that with good friends like this city of Durham, we expect the city to bail us financially or academically by introducing new technologies at our city council. On behalf of the people of Arusha, and indeed the city dwellers, I welcome you to join hands with us. What we want to do and achieve will be handed to you after this speech. I need also to, add, to draw your attention to welcome you to Arusha especially those who want to invest in the areas of interest like tourism, agribusiness, light and heavy industries, farming, animal husbandry. Those are just a few areas that you may be interested. The city have a data bank of professionals who can assist you and guide you to invest professionally 
profitably, but within the habit of the law. Honorable Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention, and God bless you. Welcome to Tanzania, indeed, welcome to the city of Arusha. And I'm happy to be here. Welcome to Arusha, the Geneva of Africa. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be here. Well, Honorable Mayor, we certainly appreciate that you've chosen to visit with us. Next, we want to recognize Hispanic Heritage Month proclamation. I'm going to ask Annabelle. Oh, right in front of me. <laughs> and Ricardo, if you would join us. There are members of the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee, and this proclamation recognizes Hispanic Heritage Month. It speaks to the fact that the National Hispanic Heritage Month is celebrated annually from September the 15th through October the 15th to celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens of ancestry from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central and South America, who as persons of Hispanic and Latin heritage has had and continues to have a profound and positive influence in the city of Durham, where is the theme for the 2017 National Hispanic Heritage Month is shaping the bright future of America, whereas the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee was established in 2002 to promote cultural understanding and inclusion and became an official committee of the City of Durham by the unanimous vote of the City Council on October 5th, 2015, whereas today many Hispanic Americans are thriving, but others are still struggling to overcome obstacles, including language and cultural barriers, <coughs> as well as discrimination, Whereas the city of Durham is committed to seeking to improve existing opportunities to open doors for Hispanics and Latino residents in the city of Durham, thereby fostering inclusive communities with equitable resources and opportunities. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 15th through October 15th, 2017, as Hispanic Heritage Month in Durham, hereby urge all citizens to honor the distinct heritage of the Hispanic community and their contributions to our city, our state, and nation by participating in relevant ceremonies, activities, and programs. Witness my hand, Corporal Seal, the City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 5th day of September, 2017, and I'm going to present this to you for any comments that you may have. Thank you. Um, good evening. The, the City of Durham's um, Human Relations Division is domiciled within the Department of Neighborhood Improvement Services, and we're pleased and honored to serve as the liaison for the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee and to present this proclamation which articulates the city's commitment to fostering communities that are not only inclusive, um, but are rich in equitable opportunities for all residents. To, fo to further acknowledge the Hispanic Heritage Month, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee will host a free event on Thursday, September the 28th at 5.30 p.m. at the Durham Arts Council. Please join us for the viewing of the film 120 Days, followed by a discussion. 120 Days is a brilliant documentary about immigration and deportation based on a family right here in the Triangle. There will also be a catered reception. For more information about this event or other current events under the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee, you can contact the Durham Human Relations Division. Thank you. Hope everyone can join us. Gracias. Next, I would ask Paula Harrington. Uh, this proclamation speaks to National Recovery Month proclamation. Uh, given the things that are happening across the country, uh, we do very appropriate. Whereas behavioral health is now recognized as an essential part of one's overall health and well-being, 
whereas the cause of not encouraging mental health and substance use recovery is significant for individuals, families, neighborhoods, and the community at large, whereas people in recovery strive to achieve healthy lifestyles, stable homes, meaningful daily activities, stronger neighborhoods, and contribute in positive ways to the larger community, whereas the American Society for Addiction Medicine, known as ASAM, reports that drug overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S. With 52,404 lethal drug overdoses in 2015, opioid addiction is driving this epidemic with 20,101 overdose deaths related to prescription pain relievers and 12,990 overdose deaths related to heroin. Four in the five new heroin users report that they started out using, misusing prescription painkillers, whereas SAMHSA reported that in 2015, 43.8 million adults experienced mental illnesses and only 14.6% received mental health treatment, and another 22.7 million adults were in need of a substance use treatment, while only 10% received treatment. But given those statistics, we must strive to reduce the stigma, shame, and embarrassment associated with brain disorders help individuals, families, and the larger community to learn to view them as we would say any other medical condition. Whereas to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the Recovery Community of Durham invite all residents of Durham, North Carolina, to participate in the National Recovery Month. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2017 as National Recovery Month. And hereby urge all residents to observe this month with appropriate programs, activities, and ceremonies to support this year's theme. Join the voices for recovery, strengthen families and communities. And witness my hand, the Corporate Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this fifth day of September 2017. And I will present this to you for. Thank you, Mayor Bear and Bell, and we're glad to be here. And he gave my speech, <laughs> but that's what he gave all the statistics. So my name is Paula Harrington. I'm a board member and financial officer for the Recovery Community of Durham, and so I want to thank the mayor and the city council members for this proclamation and your ongoing and consistent support for recovery in Durham. We actually won the reward last year for the national event. But the recovery community of Durham was formed to promote the fact that, that people can and do recover <coughs> from brain disorders. As you are aware, SAMHSA designates September as National Recovery Month for Mental and Substance Use Disorders, and we are hosting an event on September 30th at the Durham Central Park from 2 to 6 to celebrate people in recovery. And we invite you, the <coughs> mayor, the city council, and everybody to come to help support us. This event is for people in recovery, people interested in recovery, friends and family members of people in recovery, and the larger community. And it is the larger community I wish to address tonight, because without the support of the larger community, it will be difficult to reduce the shame and stigma associated with brain disorders. And that's what this is, it's brain disorders. The Surgeon General recently reported the fact that substance use disorder are a medical condition, not a sign of moral failing or weak will, but still people don't seek treatment. Why? Because of the stigma. So I think people would be outraged if someone had diabetes and was not getting treatment. But we are not, we are okay with people with substance use disorder and mental disabilities not getting the help they need <coughs> just because we're afraid to speak up. And so what we're learning with brain disorder that is all about learning how to manage symptoms and make lifestyle changes to stabilize and recover from these chronic but manageable disorders. So therefore, I stand with you, stand before you as a person in long-term recovery. That means I haven't used any drugs since April, since April 26, 1998. <laughs> and as a result of that, I was able to retire from UNC Chapel Hill, raised my daughter. I have a daughter that was a Moorhead scholar, went to UNC, was, uh, went to uh, 
Law School at NYU. Right now is the um, special assistant and counsel to the president of the Center for Responsible Lending, which they have an office right over mm -hmm. here. Just got back from Switzerland. <laughs> My daughter <laughs> uh, went to North Carolina State, and she's a research engineer from Merck. My son is graduated from Wake Forest, and he has a big church in um, Augusta, Georgia. But the point I'm saying is that they said the most important thing to them was their mother's recovery. I would not have been able to do any of those things had I not got clean and sober myself. So I, the RCOD, volunteers standing behind me, and also we have Keila over there. We are here to speak out and be a faith and a voice. See, we're tired of people thinking it's people on the street. It ain't just people on the street. It's people that look like me. And this is what recovery looks like. We invite you to give us a chance that if you know someone that suffers from this disease, you can go to our website. Uh, we have a website at Recovery Community of Durham. We have an office over at Hey Ty Harris's Center now. We do yoga classes. We do uh, art classes. But the most important thing is that we are trying to make people understand that they do not have to hide. And what we don't want to happen is our vision statement says that we envision a world where recovery thrives in supportive communities and provides innumerable opportunities to heal, to grow, and to be of service to others. We believe Durham is a supportive community, so we ask you to join with us and enjoy live music, dancing, free food, inspiring speakers, information about community resources, child-friendly activities, and with your help, plenty of hope to go around. If you know someone suffering with this disease, we ask you to talk about, talk to them and send them to us. Thank you. You gave them a lot more information than I did. That's, uh, that, was, that was great. Um, I want to ask Del Mattioli if she would join me, please. Um, Uh, this proclamation speaks to Life Insurance Awareness Month. Uh, we've done this annually, and today uh, the proclamation speaks to the fact that, according to LIMRA, International Life Insurance Company's consumer studies, 52 million people who make between $50,000 and $250,000 in annual income don't have any life insurance. Whereas the study shows 613 middle-income people die every day without enough insurance to adequately take care of their families, Whereas between 2004 and 2010, the number of people with life insurance dropped from 78% to 70%, according to CEO and President of Limer, Bob Kersner. Whereas almost 75% of Americans agree that life insurance is the best way to protect against premature death of a primary wage earner. Whereas 6 in 10 Americans say they own life insurance, while only half of them have sufficient coverage to address the financial needs of their family. And whereas 29% of Americans would like to discuss life insurance with a financial professional, yet three-fourths of American households do not have a personal life insurance agent or a personal financial advisor or planner, whereas analysts said the industry hasn't solved the puzzle of how best to reach middle-income households in a cost-efficient manner in a way that enables consumers to feel comfortable making financial decisions, whereas life insurance provides financial security for families in the event of death by helping surviving family members to meet immediate, ongoing, and future financial obligations and objectives, as well as emphasize your personal commitment to the core value of the importance of providing for the family in this trying economic climate. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have I proclaim the month of September 2017 as Life Insurance Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and to encourage all concerned to be more aware of their life insurance needs, seek professional advice, and take the actions necessary to achieve the financial security for their loved ones. I witness my hand, Corporal Silva, City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the fifth day of September 2017, and I'm going to present this to Dale for any comments that you might have. And introduce you. Good evening, everybody. This is my associate uh, financial person that works with me with Mattiola and Associates, and I must tell you that I'm passionate about saving families. Life insurance is the only commodity out here 
that will replace loss of income. Can you think of anything else? No. Okay, the, the experiences that I've had with lack of, li lack of life insurance has been detrimental and persons now feel that they cannot afford to do life insurance. Here's what I have done. Research. There are three ways to do life insurance. Some underwritten, meaning you go through the channels of getting approved. There is another product now that I have discovered within the last couple of years that is free life insurance for eligible parents that will yield $50,000 to their children should they pass. There is no premium for that insurance. You can go on my website and get more information about it. Now, I do know from my 30 years of experience that when there's life insurance left behind, there is peace, there is family cohesiveness, there is love, there is a continuation of the paradise that the breadwinners or the persons bringing in the monies will have. It's a permanent decision. The third issue is uh, policies are available for seniors or you may consider yourself a senior if you're over 40, 45, 50 or whatever, but these products are available in different ways too. You can have different tiers for persons who don't want to do, to do a medical. It's sort of first day coverage. Then there's another one where there may be a graded coverage. And then there's another one that's guaranteed coverage. All these products are available. So there's really no excuse for anyone not to seek some form of protection for the most valuable commodity that you have, and that's your heart beating. And when your heart stops, that's it. I have seen families fight and choke each other when there is no life insurance. I thought you had done it, I thought you, so I could tell you lots of testimonies in my career, but I, I'm passionate about this, and I really appreciate the mayor and the city council, and I did have a presentation and I did a presentation with uh, Councilman Steve Shule and Councilwoman Cora Cole McFadden a couple of years ago about the free life insurance for parents that have children. If we get our children educated, we can definitely help to alleviate some poverty. Education is the key. And that's what I was raised, the oldest of nine. My parents used a switch and made us get education. So all of us made it. And Henry, would you like a word? to say? Uh, well, on a personal note, the last time I was here, um, I hadn't experienced a death in my family. But since that time, my grandson died. So life insurance is not just for the old. It's not just for the middle people. It's not just for high schoolers. It's for everybody. He was eight years of age. And in one day, he was with us, and the next day, he was gone. Fortunately for us, we did have life insurance, and as, as um, Dale said, it gives you so much peace, so much continuity, so much, you know, it's, it's nice to be sitting there at the parlor, knowing that you don't have to be concerned about how am I going to take care of this child. So life insurance is passionate. It's very important, and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to tell you about that. Thank you, and have a good evening. As most of you know, we just celebrated Labor Day yesterday, and I'm going to ask Carl Riss and Councilman Steve Shule if they would join me at the podium uh, just to speak to Living Wage Day in Durham. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is, as the mayor said, uh, regarding uh, Living Wage Day in Durham. Uh, and I have here with me Carl Riss uh, from Prosperity Now, the, the new name of his organization, which does a lot of work on this. And Carl, I'll read this and then give you a chance to respond. Whereas chronic poverty is the biggest challenge to sustainable, diverse, and healthy communities, and whereas, according to the latest census data, over 17% of residents of Durham have incomes below the poverty line, and whereas the minimum wage in North Carolina is the same as the federally mandated minimum of $7.25, and 
And whereas the purchasing power, the minimum wage has lost one third of its value in inflation adjusted dollars since 1968 due to the cost of living increases. And whereas the cost of housing, food, childcare, and health care have increased substantially in the eight years since the federal minimum wage was last raised in 2009. And whereas data from the Census and American Community Survey indicate that one in four workers in Durham, or over 70,000 residents, are in low-wage jobs that pay less than $15 an hour, and whereas a living wage can lift workers out of poverty and towards greater financial security, and whereas the city of Durham is a living wage employer and is on a path to paying all city workers at least $15 an hour by 2018 and 19, and whereas more workers with higher incomes can afford to live in Durham and spend money locally, and whereas employers who pay their workers a living wage report substantially less turnover, excuse me, better job performance and higher levels of positive customer engagement. And whereas the, the mission of the Durham Living Wage Project is to support worker livelihoods by urging employers to pay living wages, to certify and publicly recognize living wage employers, and to promote living wages as a matter of conscience within our community. And whereas the Durham Living Wage Project has certified 97 employers who voluntarily pay all employees a living wage, and whereas the Durham Living Wage Project plans a drive on Labor Day, a national holiday, and throughout September to collect pledges from consumers to spend their money with employers that pay a living wage. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Belt, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the first Monday in September as Living Wage Day in Durham, and hereby urge and encourage local consumers to support businesses that pay their workers a living wage. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this, the fifth day of September, 2017. And Carl, I'll turn this over to you for any remarks you might have. Thank you so much, Mayor Bell, Councilperson Shul, and, and City Council members. I just want to say three things real briefly. First of all, I want to thank the City of Durham for being one of the first living wage employers. The City of Durham first passed the Living Wage Ordinance back in 1998, and it's that Living Wage Ordinance that really sets the framework for the Living Wage Project in Durham. It's your standard of living wages that we apply to firms that voluntarily pay all their employees a living wage in Durham. So we thank you for setting the framework for this project in Durham. Secondly, I want to thank the 97 living wage firms in Durham. It's everything from, from coffee shops to website firms, and everything from contractors to daycare centers. Um, that do well by paying their employees a living wage and doing right by their employees. And lastly, I want to thank all the, all the citizens of Durham that support living wage firms in Durham. I want to encourage everyone in this room, along with all the folks in Durham, to support living wage firms with your dollars um, to make Durham a living wage community. Thank you so much. I'd like to recognize uh, any comments from council members. I recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as uh, the city council's representative on the board of the Durham Arts Council, it's my happy privilege to um, make the announcement that a center fest is returning to Durham in less than two weeks. Uh, Saturday, September 16th, and Sunday, September 17th, will mark the largest center fest celebration of the century here in Durham. Uh, which is fitting because, as Senator Mike Woodard is fond of saying, Durham is the cultural and arts capital of North Carolina. Uh, this year's Center Fest uh, features 146 juried visual artists that will showcase and sell their original handcrafted work in clay, drawing, fibers, glass, painting, photography, printmaking, wood, jewelry, mixed media, and sculpture, although hopefully not all at the same time. Uh, 70, over 74 performing acts on six stages throughout downtown. And a new uh, project this year, the, D the Durham Arts Village, a special space set aside exclusively for Durham nonprofits, Durham food vendors, and Durham's rising artistic talent. The other new thing this year, Mr. Mayor, uh, Saturday night will feature expanded entertainment uh, downtown through 11 p.m. Uh, the main stage at CCB Plaza will feature two live musical performances, followed by, believe it or not, a movie and popcorn. Um, and not one or two, but three beer trucks. We have all the appropriate licensing in place. <laughs> Um, so encourage folks to head out uh, and see the best uh, that Durham has to offer uh, on the 16th and 17th. The second announcement I wanted to make is that uh, tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock, I will be hosting a Facebook Live session um, 
that will, in which I will walk through the process of reviewing the work session agenda for the following day. Our work session, of course, is Thursday at one o'clock. Uh, I'm not sure many folks in the general public uh, have a real sense of how items appear in our agenda for these Monday night meetings, uh, but it's after a considerable amount of staff work and some often um, informative questions by, by council members that we arrive at the agenda items that you're about to read off to us on the consent agenda. And so tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock, I'll be doing this Facebook Live session answering questions about the agenda um, and anything that folks want to know about the process. Even though um, it's not on the agenda, I'm also willing to discuss the fact that I'm wearing seersucker the day after Labor Day. Um, it's something I feel strongly about, and tonight I'm living my values. So um, if people want to share their thoughts with me about that tomorrow, I'm happy to do that too. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, are there other announcements? I, I want to take a point of personal privilege uh, this evening. As all the council knows, the administration knows, and maybe the city knows that uh, each year we do a budget, and there's a budget document that the staff produces. Uh, they gave us the budget document, I guess it was a week ago, and I really hadn't had an opportunity to uh, thank the manager and administration for uh, for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because I'm a survivalist <laughs> for 16 years, or maybe I did contribute certain things to, to the council uh, for featuring me on this year's budget. Uh, people don't generally read budgets, documents, but I can tell you I read this one <laughs> <laughs> to make sure I understood why they had me on, on the front page. But on, on a serious matter, I, I really, I, I've been attending uh, several community forums for city council candidates, mayoral candidates, and I, I've really been sort of astonished to hear some of the comments that have been made by some of the candidates that are running for for office, and it's painfully aware to me that they haven't done the homework. Uh, with some of the numbers they throw out about, like the city's invested a billion dollars in downtown Durham, we spent $70 million for the Durham Performance Arts Center, just a whole lot of things that are, aren't factual. And I'm almost of the opinion that maybe one of the requirements to run for city council is you ought to read the city budget. Because if you look at this document, it pretty much lays out the whole operation of city government. Uh, where the money comes from, how it's spent, the process that we go through with the administration to derive this budget. And it's a wealth of information. And I would recommend it to anyone that's seriously considering running for the city council or the office uh, in any particular time. I want to congratulate again the administration and the budget office as you constantly get commendations from other members of this council how well you do in preparing this budget, the things that you go through to get the final product. And it's been really a pleasure for me to be a part of this and more importantly, to learn and see the process evolve ultimately to the final budget that we get. Uh, notwithstanding that this year you decided to put me on the front of the budget. You guys did a, have done a super job in past years and uh, I hope this isn't a bump in the road and you continue to do so uh, in future years. So again, uh, Mr. Manager and Administration, members of the council, uh, thank you for allowing me to make those few comments. Let me ask for the priority items by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I appreciate, Mayor, uh, your comments about the the, uh, the budget. The staff works very hard at, uh, at putting that together, but it's a, it's a collaboration that uh, takes all of us working together, the mayor, the council members, and the community to, to do this work. I don't have any priority items this evening, but I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate you and your alma mater, the uh, Howard Bison, <laughs> on the uh, greatest upset in NCAA college football history with their uh, their win on Saturday against the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, I believe okay. it was. In Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, so congratulations. 45-point <laughs> underdog, the largest uh, underdog upset in the history of the NCAA, so congratulations. I, I'm just sorry I didn't place a bet on it. Uh, $100 would have gotten your picture pal. Now, can you beat the NCAA? Don't win all the time. Thank you. Recognize the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, city clerk. What did you? Okay. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda, and uh, the first item is the consent agenda. I read the heading of each item on the consent agenda. If a member of the council or a person in the public pulls it, we'll discuss that later. 
in the agenda night. <clears throat> Item one uh, on the consent agenda is Durham City County Appearance Commission appointment. Item two is the mayor's nominee for reappointment to the Durham Historic Preservation Commission. Item three is the Raleigh Durham Airport Authority Federal Aviation Administration grant offer. FAA AIP grant number 3-37-0056-048-2017 and FAA AIP grant number 3-37-0056-049-2017. Item five is the Development Ventures Incorporated request for the subordination of home declaration of restrictive covenants. Item six is the interlocal agreement among the City of Durham, Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization, and the City of Graham for the NC-54 West Corridor Study and Grant Project Ordinance. Item seven is agreement with the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization and the North Carolina Department of Transportation for the US-15501 Corridor Study and Grant Project Ordinance. Item eight is the 2017 Downtown Durham Parking Study. Item nine is July 2017 bid report. Item 10 is grant agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation and the city of Durham for the R. Kelly Bryant Bridge South Trail Project. Item 11 are amendments to fair housing ordinance and rules and amendments to human relations commission ordinance. Item 12 is the National League of Cities Financial Inclusion System and City Leadership Grant Project Ordinance. Item 14 is adoption of aquatic facilities master plan as an addendum to the 2013 City of Durham Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Items 15 through 18 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda item. So moved, Mr. Second. Clerk. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Thank you. It passed, it passed seven to zero. Uh, we'll move to the general business agenda for public hearings. Item 15 is consolidated annexation for Pickett and Garrett. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Pat Young with Planning Department. Uh, Jacob Wiggins of our staff, who usually presents these items, is on a brief and well-deserved vacation, so you are stuck with me tonight. <laughs> Um, I can first certify for the record that all public hearing items before you are, uh, have been advertised and noticed as required by law, and there are affidavits to that effect on file with the planning department. Uh, as the mayor called the case to BDG 16-00010, which is a request by Doc Nichols Partners for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and zoning map change for an approximately 71-acre uh, set of parcels, actually six parcels, at the southwestern quadrant of Pickett Road in Garrett. Road, uh, as, as shown in attachment one of your staff report. The applicant is requesting an exact translational zoning, which means it's the identical zoning that's found currently in Durham County for the property, but uh, with the city designation, which would allow up to 105 residential units if approved. Uh, uh, this request would become effective on September 30th, 2017, uh, also if approved. The public works and water management departments uh, have performed the required utility impact analysis. and. Uh, <clears throat> for the utility extension agreement and determine that the existing city of Durham water and sewer mains have capacity for the proposed level of development at the site. Uh, the budget management services department performed a fiscal impact analysis which determined that the proposed annexation uh, would become revenue positive very shortly after annexation. Uh, two motions are required to approve this item. The, the first uh, is required by law to approve the utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation and the second is to approve the consistency statement and the zoning map change. Uh, staff recommends uh, approval uh, of the item and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I uh, would ask first are there comments, questions by members of the council? Hearing none, we have two persons that have signed up to speak. Uh, I'll designate five minutes on each side. We have Jared Edens. And let me ask, is anyone else who wants to speak? in support of this item. Well, Jared is the only one who signed up to speak. Uh, and then I have one person that has signed up to speak in opposition. 
uh, John Robbins. And is there anyone else that wants to speak in opposition to this matter? I'm doing this to make sure I allocate enough time. Uh, that being the case, I recognize Jared Edens. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land. I uh, here represent my client, uh, Doc Nichols Partners. I uh, appreciate Pat's summary of our project. I'm just going to point to um, a few specific items that are unique with this project. If council is to um, approve our annexation, uh, we would be able to develop a project that is it's unique in that it won't be masqueraded, uh, which I can say from over the past four or five years, this will be the first project that we've designed that where the property wasn't clear cut and masqueraded. This is actually an, an R20 zone project, quarter acre lots or greater, so it won't be masqueraded. Uh, the streets are, have been designed uh, with an alternate street section, a shoulder and ditch. Uh, this accomplishes two things. One, it makes this project uh, look much more consistent with Garrett Farms next door, and it also provides an added environmental benefit because shoulder and ditch sections naturally uh, filtrate water more than curb and gutter will, because curb and gutter won't infiltrate at all, obviously. Uh, the utilities are existing and actually on the property. The sewer uh, that serves the property runs along the property, north-south. Uh, water is existing in Garrett and Pickett Roads. And the one thing we're doing with this project, uh, we were made aware months ago that there were some stormwater issues uh, with the Garrett Farms development south of us. You know, there's floodplain that runs across our property and the Garrett Farms property. So what we've done, we've designed um, all three of our ponds on this project to detain the 100-year storm, uh, which is far exceeds what ordinance requirements are. And as a result of that, when you compare post-development, the amount of the 100-year storm leaving our property, when you compare that to pre-development at that Garrett Farms connection point, we're going to reduce that flow by about 60% from what is currently there now. Uh, we're also diverting about 12 acres of drainage that's currently draining directly onto Garrett Farms and those property owners along our southern boundary. We're diverting 12 acres around those lots, taking it to the pond and around the rear. Uh, so we think that this is a good, unique project that's going to do some good for our neighbors and uh, be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Other questions for the proponent? If not, <clears throat> recognize John Robbins. Mr. Robbins, present. Mr. So Robbins, you have uh, five minutes. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm in opposition to this, but I do have a few questions. One is, if you approve this uh, rezoning tonight, are you also approving the project? Uh, good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. So what this would do is allow the applicant to get additional entitlements, meaning approvals for development. They'd have to get a site plan, which makes sure that all the city's uh, site development criteria, such as the stormwater facility you heard Mr. Edens describe, is, is designed and constructed exactly as he described, as well as construction drawings, which are detailed engineering drawings. So what it does is allow them to pursue additional approvals, including building permits, that would allow them to put the development in place. Could you tell me why the People in the community weren't notified of this request uh, until now? Sure. So they, they were notified in accordance with law. This, this is what's called an initial zoning. Initial zoning means that it's the exact same zoning that's in place in the county. It's just being uh, going to be taken into the city limits. And that has a different notification standard than other types of approvals. It's a 100-foot uh, notification range rather than a 600-foot pursuant to law. So those folks were notified directly via U.S. mail. Well, I'll just express my uh, concerns in, in by saying, one, I don't know if anybody's taken into consideration the people who live in this community who already are overtaxed with automobiles coming down Pickett Road. I almost need to hire an off-duty police officer to get me out of my driveway. We've got three schools. We have uh, several churches. We have two retirement centers. We're now getting a, a project going up on uh, where the old Carol Sun property is to uh, do retail and some other office spaces. 
uh, and we're inundated with traffic. Uh, I see some traffic measurements going on, but it's always after school close. And you, it's not getting a true measurement of how much traffic we do have out there. The other thing is uh, wildlife. We have a, a large herd of deer out there. We have uh, coyotes. We have red fox. We have uh, a whole family of owls. And uh, they don't do too good in the city. So, But I guess we'll find out whether they survive in the city or not. Uh, we also have a new uh, 130, I think it's 128-unit uh, old folks home going up in the other side of the Pepsi-Cola plant. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, you need to come out there sometime, stand on the street corner, and watch how much traffic we got to deal with. And I just don't think that a, a sufficient study of the traffic patterns has been done to add another 129 health, uh, 100. I'm sorry, 99 houses, and it also doesn't take into account that the Leela uh, Garrett property is also going to request to be brought into the city, and I think 14 or 15 houses are going there. It's incredible. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Again, this is a public hearing. I would ask, is there anyone else that would like to speak that has not signed up to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter's back before the council. Do we move the consistency statement? Second. It's the utility piece. The utility extension agreement is first. Okay. So move the... What do we I say? move the utility extension agreement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Further discussion, recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I appreciated the comments uh, by the gentleman. Um, so, uh, Mr. Young, question for you. This is an exact translation of the county's existing zoning, is that right? Yes, sir. So we're not adding any density to this property by approving this in terms of what is allowed to be built there. Is that correct or not? That is correct. So I'm sympathetic to, I'm sorry, I don't see the gentleman now. Uh, I'm sorry, thank you. I understand your concern about uh, traffic and growth and, um, but what we're doing now is not changing the developer's ability to build this number of units at this location. Uh, we are not adding to the density. Sometimes we do. We're often faced with situations where we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to allow more density. But we're not in this situation. Uh, the developer can build this number of units by right already. Uh, so just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I guess... Um I don't normally comment on when McCulloch say something, but I suspect if you didn't have water and sewer, you wouldn't be able to do this project at this density. I mean, so that, that's really the issue. That's why I suspect that they want to be annexed into the city so they can have utilities. Otherwise, uh, I doubt they could build this project at the level that they're talking about without water and city utilities. I just wanted to make that clear. I think quite fair enough. Ask. Fair enough, Mr. Mayor. Are, are there other comments? Questions on this item? Uh, if not, uh, the public hearing has been closed. We had a motion a second to approve the uh, utility agreement. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote. It passes seven to zero. the consistency statement. It's been properly moved and second that we approve the consistency statement. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Yeah. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. 
Thank you. We'll move to the next item, uh, which is the consolidated annexation for 730 Dulera Drive. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of council. This is uh, case BDG 1600017, which is a uh, utility extension agreement request, voluntary annexation and zoning map change request received from Javad Kargar for an approximately 0.61 acre parcel located at 730 Dulair Drive. Uh, and what this is is a request to do an exact translational zoning. It's currently rural residential in the county. Uh, the request is to uh, have this annexed into the city uh, to allow for the construction of a single family home on the site. And uh, this would be effective September 30th, 2017, similar to the previous item, if approved. Uh, the Public Works and Water Management Departments conducted the required utility impact analysis for the utility extension agreement and found that uh, the existing water and sewer main capacity at this location was acceptable for the proposed level of development. The Budget Management Services Department performed a fiscal impact analysis and determined that the proposed annexation would become revenue positive shortly upon uh, following annexation. Uh, just like the last item, two motions are required to approve this item. The first uh, would be to approve the utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation, and the second is to adopt a consistency statement and the initial zoning. Uh, staff recommends approval of the item and will be happy to take any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Would ask other questions of the council of the staff report. Uh, no one has signed up to speak on this item, but I would ask is that anyone that wants to speak on this item, either for or against, a comment. Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item. I would declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back for council, Mr. Mayor. I recognize council Martin. I have a question for staff. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just making sure I understand this. This is. This lot would support one house, is that correct? Correct. One house on one lot? Correct. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Again, entertain a motion on the item. Move, move the utility extension agreement. Second. And properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Is it open? Close the vote. Passes seven to zero. No, I, I, I don't think it was open, really. Okay, so can you open it again? Well, let, let's do this. All in favor of the motion, and keep us saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Entertain the next motion. Consistency statement. Move the consistency statement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you try to open the vote this time? Close the vote. Passes seven to zero. Uh, let's move to item. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Um, Pardon me. I heard a motion for the consistency statement. I'm not sure I heard one for the annexation ordinance. Um, if I admit, if I didn't hear it, I apologize. If I if it was hasn't been moved yet, I'll move the annexation ordinance. Do we need to do the zoning ordinance too? Ex ex excuse Council me. Yeah, Council Member Moffat, the, the annexation uh, portion was included with the utility extension. Yeah. Agreement. So it's, okay. it's in the yeah, same motion. Yeah. Right. Consolidate, yeah. Um, move to item 18. Seven. No, it's 17. Seven. Consolidated annexation for Jacobs Glass, BDG 17000001. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. Pat Young again with the Planning Department. Uh, this is a request, Mr. Uh, the mayor called the case number. This is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning designation uh, <coughs> proposed by LR Jacobs LLC for an approximately 9.9 .9 acre parcel located at 4915 Hillsboro Road. Um, this would be a request to extend uh, the city limits is immediately adjacent to existing city limits, and if approved, uh, would take effect on September 30th, 2017, just like the previous two items. Uh, the subject site is divided between Orange and Durham counties uh, and is primarily in Orange County. Uh, the, uh, there is existing development, uh, light industrial and warehouse development on this site. Uh, it is a, a glass um, concern, uh, wholesale concern. There is uh, the proposal uh, at this location is to add a, an approximately 30,000 square foot 
uh, warehouse building on the Orange County portion of the site, and that has necessitated a new water service connection, which has led to the requirement that uh, annexation be sought. Uh, so uh, the uh, Public Works and Water Management Departments perform the utility impact analysis uh, required for this uh, proposal and determine that the existing city and water, city of Durham water and uh, sewer utilities, although only water is being requested, have the capacity for the proposed development. And the Budget Management Services Department performed a fiscal impact analysis which determined that the proposed annexation would become revenue positive post build out. Uh, the Durham Planning Commission at their July 11th meeting uh, recommended approval of this item uh, by a vote of 11 to 0, and they, they only commented on the uh, rezoning, which was to the IL, Industrial Light Zoning District. Um, they don't review annexation items. Uh, two motions are required, just like the previous items. The first is to approve the utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation uh, petition, and the second is to approve the consistency statement and the initial zoning. Uh, staff recommends approval, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask other questions by members of the council. If not, I have one person that is signed up to speak. They were pro signed up as a proponent and as an opponent, um, Chad Abbott. Did, did you mark the card incorrectly? No, <laughs> it's a very confusing case. So. Okay. Um, right. um, hopefully, I, I, I don't confuse you the way I confused the planning board. Right. You have uh, three minutes to mention uh, it. Perhaps uh, I'll give you a little uh, history here. Uh, Mr. Jacobs. Oh, I am, I'm Chad Abbott with Summit Design, uh, 504 Meadowland Drive, Hillsborough, North Carolina. We represent Jacobs Glass, uh, Mr. Larry Jacobs. Um, I appreciate your time tonight and the opportunity to speak. Um, back in 2014, we started a process of rezoning with Orange County. Uh, this was a two parcel. Uh, it was two parcels. Original glass factory was on one in Orange County, receiving City of Durham services, I assume through some extension agreement between the two because it's in an economic development district. Um, so at that time, he had an operating facility in Orange County, uh, paying the additional fees for water sewer services, but was not annexed. Uh, he then, at the urging of Orange County, combined a parcel he acquired behind it that was owned by Duke Forest. He acquired that parcel so he could relocate a warehouse he was leasing somewhere else uh, to this facility, build his own plant, and stop leasing the warehouse. Um, he did recombine them, so now, as a consequence to requesting this annexation, his original parcel that was in or or Orange County uh, will now fall into Durham County. And the only reason we are requesting the annexation is because we're required to, to add an additional water service for the new building. Um, and, it, it, and there's a section in your ordinance that allows you, uh, at your sole discretion, uh, section 70-129, number seven, which reads, a limited exception to the voluntary annexation requirement may be provided to the property located in an economic development zone that is established pursuant to an interlocal cooperation agreement. Um, and so, and, and it continues on, and I don't want to bore you by reading the whole thing, but it is in your ordinance that allows him to request a utility connection, however you not formally annex him. And I don't know how that comes into play, uh, Patrick, uh, and how that, that's why I put proponent, because I want you to do something, but we don't want to be annexed. Um, because, uh, well, like I said, we started on this in 2014. The county of uh, Orange County says they sent uh, courtesy reviews to Durham, and I, and I guess maybe things just don't get connected sometimes when it's that early on in the process, but he might have pursued this whole project in a different fashion, such as not recombining the two parcels, uh, et cetera. Uh, had he known this would be a request and a requirement at the end to, to just have a water service. All, all being the, the, the assumption was he had water and sewer service then and he recombined it to his property and just needs another service for the new building, assumed it would always be in Orange County and would not have to go through that uh, process. So I don't know if you would wish to exercise that, uh, that exception, number seven, but, but that, that is our request. Would, would the new building have water and sewer, or just water? Y yes, uh, the, the new building would have water and sewer, uh, but there's a possibility we, we can use the existing sewer tap to connect both buildings, being that it has been recombined in one parcel, and he owns both buildings. So the rate that you pay now, the rate that you pay now for water and sewer for the building that's inside the city, that's in this area, do they, do they pay the regular rates or what? 
Uh, uh, he's paying. He's paying outside city rates. So you're paying outside city rates. Yes, okay. Yes, All right. Yes, paying outside city rates. I don't know if the staff has some comments. Mr. 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 I would just, just comment, and certainly Mr. Young can follow up. But the provision uh, in the, that's being referenced uh, was put in place so the council had the flexibility. This is that area of the uh, or Orange County uh, Industrial Park Extension. We added that used, the language used to be automatic that you you had to annex if you wanted utility service, but because of the the kind of linear uh, w uh, westerly uh, direction that this uh, industrial park goes, we came back and added uh, some flexibility so that if we had a parcel that was you know further out and not adjacent to the city limits, the council would have the flexibility to uh, not annex, but can you know but to uh, to provide or the city would have the, the opportunity to not annex, but provide the utility service. In this case, the property is immediately adjacent to the city limits, and that's why we would recommend to move forward with the annexation. If this, if this property was, I don't know how many miles out, is that, that extension could be a long way out from a service delivery standpoint, it would be very problematic. In this case, it's immediately adjacent to the city limits. So they would receive all, of, they would be <coughs> eligible to receive all of the city services. Correct. If we're annexed, police, fire, Correct. Jobs and all that stuff. Okay. And plus you would get the rates would be city inside rates. Correct. Okay. I would I would ask uh, Patrick if this, you know, we, like I said, we started in 2014, went through a whole site plan approval permitting process with Orange County. Um, and I've I've been told by planning that that site plan would remain valid because it was approved. Is that not true? Mm-hmm. So if the, if the property is, uh, Pat Young again with the planning department, if the property is annexed, it would ha the site plan would have to be approved in the city of Durham. Um, we've done a cursory or preliminary review of the site plan that was reviewed and approved by Orange County, and there would only be, I think, you know, minor changes, but it, you'd have to get a, site, a Durham site, site plan because our zoning jurisdiction would be, the land and, development and, jurisdiction would be. And that was the reason. We've already been held up over a year trying to work through this process of getting this uh, because he assumed he would have service just like he did on his existing building uh, that was not in the city. And now he's been held up about almost nine months trying to, to get the annexation plat prepared, to get the legal description. Just to get in front of you, we started this about in January when we submitted DOT permits to tap the line. And we've had a site plan approval from Orange County since 2016. Um, he could have went ahead and started hoping that he would get water service approval because we have the grading permits and everything else needed. Uh, now we would have to delay him further, and he's leasing a building, and he, he's already gotten an extension to, to cover this time period. Um, and so that site plan approval that would be required to come through the city and then construction drawings uh, because of the infrastructure that's being a stormwater ponds, and so it would have to go to construction drawing review. Um, that would that would take a, a, another, you know, six months or at least, so I would I would expect. And, and that's the reason he's requesting for, for council to exercise this exception because the Orange County told us, I mean, we asked why did this not come up before now, et cetera. They said they sent cursory reviews, et cetera. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I, I just know that that's what they told us uh, starting in 2014. And it's kind of at the end of the road where he's ready to build, paying extra lease uh, modifications and, and extensions on his other warehouse he's leasing so he can build this. Recognize, recognize Councilman Reese. <coughs> Sir, can you help me understand? You may have explained this at the beginning, but obviously I didn't understand it. Why, why, did, why is this here as a, as a voluntary annexation and not just a utility extension agreement? Because since we're outside the city, we can't request for utilities, even though it's just a service, no new cost to the city on any on main or infrastructure. It's just a service. We cannot request a tap or service without requesting voluntary annexation. If I may, Mr. Mr. Uh, Council Member Reese and members of Council, mm -hmm. that's precisely right. And I think as the manager said, um, you all have the discretion to authorize only the utility extension agreement, but it's required that uh, voluntary annexation be sought. But again, as the manager said, the criteria uh, that the Council has suggested to consider is service delivery impacts. And because this is immediately adjacent to city limits, there are, there are no negative service delivery impacts to annexation. As the manager suggested, this is a linear, several mile long linear economic development zone following I-85 into, into Orange County. If this property was on the end, western end of that, there would be substantial service delivery impacts. But because it's immediately adjacent, 
we staff and um, of all the service delivery departments didn't recognize any. I'm, s I'm sorry to be dense, but don't don't we often doesn't the city often enter into utility extension agreements outside the city limits? Don't no, we? Not since 2012. Not without annexations. Okay. I'll tell you another you, reason. Didn't the, city, didn't the city staff just jump through hoops a couple of months ago to help a nice family just on the other side of the city limits get connected to? So well, those those are the only exceptions if they have a contaminated uh, service. By the help okay, the so that's that's the level. Of, thank you. I appreciate. It. Just still learning the job. Thanks. <laughs> Recognize Councilman Shule. I think that. Councilmember Reese's problem is he's wearing seersucker after Aberdeen's <laughs> I'll allow it. Um, Mr. Young, um, the, 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 uh, the gentleman, I'm sorry, sir, I just don't remember. Chad, Chad Abbott. Uh, asked about the, uh, or talked about the time that it would take to go through the processes necessary to uh, get a site plan and so forth done. Can you give us an estimate of that? Sure, so um, if I might uh, quickly add to a point of information before I answer your question directly. The right, the, the process Mr. Abbott described was that uh, he and his client went to Orange County. Orange County did a full review without notification or disclosure of, the, of this requirement. I'm not criticizing my colleagues over there. It's not their utility system, but when as soon as they came to the city, the city said, you have to go through this process. So I don't think there's been any undue delay at that time. However, as you're suggesting, he would have to get it, and I said earlier, a, a city of Durham site plan. Um, that process can be completed within, well within 90 days if there is a high quality submittal and a minimum time between resubmittals if there are any comments that are non-compliant with the ordinance. Um, the average is about four months. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we would then have to go to construction drawings after that. That's where they have an additional. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Schumer. I don't know. Reese. <laughs> One day, maybe. Um, I don't have a question, but I did want to speak to the merits of the proposal. Is this the appropriate time to do that? Sure. Great. Um, what, you speak to whose proposal? The, the staff recommendation I wanted to I'll talk about. I was going to say the mayor's. That's what I oh, no. <laughs> just wanted to talk about what we're here to do. I didn't have any more questions for anybody. Um, I understand the staff's position here. I think it's well thought out. Um, I think there is good reason, there really is no good reason not to proceed under voluntary annexation. There's no good reason to make use of the exception, except that I think we shouldn't annex people if they don't want to be annexed. This, this, so these folks uh, had a reason to use the voluntary annexation process because they couldn't access uh, city water and sewer in any other way, um, but we, but I think it should be a principle of how we operate in this area that if someone doesn't want to be annexed, we ought to figure out how not to annex them. And we gave ourselves an out here. It, I think, wasn't intended to apply under this circumstance because this particular piece of property is right up against the city limits. And as I understand from the city manager's description, it was intended to apply in situations where. Um, the annexation would pose service delivery obstacles, um, mostly in a situation where the new property is not contiguous with the city limits. Having said that, I think um, they will be, what, um, um, actually, Pat, can you tell us what relative uh, rate for water and sewer they would be paying if we made use of this limited exception? So I can't quote uh, the, the rates, yeah, but I, I believe it's a 50%. Double the rates. Double oh, the rates. Yeah, I just want to make sure, yeah. So, um, you know, the city is getting its uh, it getting its due. If we make use of the limited exception, we're um, charging the uh, property owner double uh, rates for water and sewer the way we do for other uh, utility extension agreements. Uh, and we don't, we are not in a position to be providing uh, other types of services that annexed properties provide. Um, I think this particular situation is such a narrow sub- class of situation that it's not likely to ever come up in quite this configuration again. And so uh, I think it makes sense to use the tools we have to give effect to the will of the folks who own this property, which is to pay double for water and sewer, but not necessarily be part of the city. And that's, I intend to uh, figure out how to vote that way. I will, thanks. Um, 
Okay, the Rick Knox Council Shul. Mr. Mayor, um, while I'm sympathetic to the applicant's concerns, I think that, and, and no one has to be, if you don't want to be annexed, you know, don't apply for these things, is what I would say. Uh, we're not forcing anyone to be annexed here, uh, except that they want our services. And so I think that when they want our services, they also ought to be part of our tax base. And so I'll be voting for, um, I'll be voting for the staff recommendation. I, I guess the other part of the, about this is um, the General Assembly took away our authority to do annexation. <coughs> So it's the only way that we really can do annexation now is if somebody volunteers to come in. Uh, so somewhere down the road, we felt that it was appropriate to annex this property after having given the warden's sewer utilities and the person said, I don't want to be annexed, we couldn't do anything. And so I, I think our, I, I, I'm trying to balance the two and I guess I come down on the side, uh, again, that their services are gonna be provided by the city if they're part of this, if he's a part of the city. He gets the same inside city rates or the sewer that everybody else gets. Additionally, he gets the fire protection, police protection against garbage and all the stuff that comes along with it. Um, so I, I, you can't have it both ways, I guess that's what I'm saying. It comes with a penalty depending on where you are when you, when you ask for these type of uh, requests from the city. But we've, we've had, is there any more discussion on this item? The other thing I would just add, Mr. Mayor, uh, when we had our have our agreement with Orange County that provided for the extension of uh, water and sewer service out to this area, uh, that was you know clearly a discussion that was agreed to by Orange County, as, you know, and I mean aware of by Orange County from the beginning of these discussions, which have probably been going on for I don't know, seven or eight years now. Okay, uh, public hearing is closed on this item. Uh, entertain a motion on item. I'll move the uh, ordinance. The ordinance annexing Jacobs Glass and the City of Durham. Along with the yes. Was that a second? Second. It's been proper to move the second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Can we just clarify, Pat, is that correct or should it be the uh, approval of the utility extension agreement? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. The, the first vote is for the utility extension agreement and voluntary annexation petition. It's combined. Combined, I'm sorry. You want that again, Mr. Mayor? As long as the record's clear. Do you want it again, Madam Clerk? Uh, the motion passes six to one with Councilman Maurice voting no. Yeah, but what the motion was included annexation but it didn't include the utility extension agreement. And if you modify your menu motion to that. Happy to do so, Mr. Mayor. He's amended his motion to include utility extension, utility extension agreement. And will we make a second? Second. Okay, given that, open the vote again. Can you open? Open. And close it. It passes six to one with council member Reese voting no. Mr. Mayor, I'll uh, move the consistency statement and the proposed initial zoning. Second. Second. It's improper to move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I just follow up too and make a just for record to ask the planning department to be sure and follow up with Orange County to be sure that there is no longer or you know no future confusions. Maybe you've already done that, Pat, but if not, that we have some follow up with their uh, development review folks in Orange County so that we uh, we don't have this uh, overlapping review again. Yeah, certainly will, Mr. Manager. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I did talk to Michael Harvey, who's the current planning manager over there, and I uh, had a lengthy conversation about procedural improvements to ensure that we're getting notified when these are proposed uh, so that we can let them know when they would be subject to this request. Thank you. So thank you. Okay, let's move to item 18. A request for reduction by owner measurement incorporated 
and its related and affiliated entities to remove property from the existing downtown municipal service district. Mr. Mayor, members of council, my name is Andre Pettigrew. I'm the director of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. The Office of Economic and Workforce Development recommends that the Durham City Council hold the public hearing pursuant to GS 160A-538.1A on the request to remove from the Downtown Business Improvement District properties owned by Measurement Incorporated, Measurement Durham LLC, Measurement Building LLC, 711 Washington Street LLC, and 715 Washington Street LLC. The Office of Economic Development, Economic and Workforce Development further recommends that Durham City Council vote to approve the following motion. The City Council of the City of Durham finds that the following parcels of the 21 parcels listed in the agenda memo are not in need of the services, facilities, and functions of the service district, the bid services, to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city, colon, none. If the council wishes to find contrary to the administration's recommendation <clears throat> that one or more of these parcels are not in need of the bid services to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city, the above motion would be changed by deleting the word none and replacing it with a list of parcels that are not in need of the bid services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, again, this is a public hearing item. Uh, you've heard the staff report and recognize. A staff just spoke. Yeah. I was going to say, do you have questions? Um, on Exhibit 6 in the, in the uh, attachments for this matter um, is the ordinance to remove property. Were you suggesting when you were reading it just now that the word none should appear under section one? I'll let uh, Fred Lamar. Exhibit six. Uh, good evening, Fred Lamar with the city attorney's office. If I could respond to your question, uh, Councilman Reese. Uh, that is just a sample um, ordinance that if you okay. did identify any properties then, and you wanted to vote on that tonight, um, you, you could have that uh, form um, it doesn't have to be tonight. If you decided on a property, on one or more properties, uh, then that would be the form of the ordinance that would have to be adopted at two uh, meetings of the council. So tonight we're just here for the public hearing, then. Is that correct? Th that's, uh, it depends on what the council decides at the end of the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Can you recognize Councilman Martin. <coughs> Fred, I want to follow up on that. Um, do I understand that... If, <laughs> just going to ask if 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 it's our determination that none of the parcels should be removed, then do we take no action, or do we have a? Is there an action to be taken? So it is um, in the discretion of the uh, city council uh, that uh, if you do, if when subsequent to the public hearing, you do make that the finding. Um, and identify parcels that would apply. You may then take the next step, if you if you decide you want to do that, to actually remove uh, some or all of the parcels. But that has to be done by ordinance. You name the parcel and the owner name, and then you have to adopt that uh, ordinance at two of your meetings. And that's if we determine that one or more parcels should be removed from the bid. That's correct. I was actually asking, in the event that we find, find that no parcel should be removed, does that require, is there an action that we take? No. Okay. That's the purpose of that, uh, that motion, to find none, the motion that was presented. That's all. We just... Uh, uh, then, then there is an action. There's Take a motion. I mean, make a pass up. Except that finding that was read by Mr. Pettigrew. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, are there other questions by members of the council? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, determine the amount of time to allocate for this item. Uh, what I need to understand is from the proponents. I see you have, I have one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven persons that have signed up to speak. Mayor Bell, uh, my name is Bill Bryan with Morningstar Law Group. I am here as the attorney for the proponents or the applicant as I'll refer to them. Um, we actually have four speakers, including myself. We have three in reserve in case somebody needs to yield their time because we were not given a good understanding as to how this process was gonna, was gonna work. What I would like to do, what I would propose is that we put on our presentation, I'll make a short opening statement, the three uh, other witnesses will testify or will make their statements, and then I'll make a brief closing statement, and then you can take folks in whatever order you want to, uh, to, uh, to in opposition to the application. Okay. Let's, let's try it this way. We have 12 persons that have signed up to speak in opposition to it. How many? 12. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I allow each of those persons three minutes, <clears throat> you've got 36 minutes for opposition. So I would then say the those that are proponents, you have 36 minutes. We should be able to do it in that amount of time. Okay, but I want to make sure that we've got, I've got all the people here. I've got uh, William J. Bryan, Jeffrey Rother. 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 Uh, Brian Shrek, uh, Herb Shirk, Shirk, Hank Shirk, Hank Shirk. Hank Shirk. Well, he said he does Hank. Okay, Joe McClintock, Don Timberlake, and George Davis. Right. Does that represent our attention that only myself, Mr. Rother, and two Mr. Shirk will okay. actually speak? All right. So we proceed with you as thirty-six minutes. All right. We ready to go? Sure. All right, good evening. My name is Bill Bryan with the Morningstar Law Group, and I am the attorney for the owners who are seeking to have their property removed from Durham Business Improvement District pursuant to Section 168.3.538.A1 of the North Carolina General Statutes. That statute provides that the council should remove property from the bid on request of a property owner if it finds, based upon the materials presented, that the property in question does not need the services provided by the bid to a greater extent than other portions of the city. All of the properties in question shown on the map in the first two slides, uh, here they are, and go ahead, next one, Jeff, are uh, either owned by or affiliated with Measurement Incorporated, and therefore we are going to refer to them as the MI properties. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out our position is that this issue should not be handled through a public hearing of the type that you're holding tonight, but rather should be presented in a quasi-judicial hearing in which all the fair trial standards uh, for the preservation of our clients' rights to due process are preserved. However, the city attorney disagrees, uh, and therefore we have lodged a formal objection for the record with his office and the office of city manager. But that said, we're prepared to proceed tonight and will do so. The question before you tonight is not whether you want the MI property to be a part of the bid. The question is whether you can find, based upon the information presented to you, that the MI properties are in need of the services provided by the bid to a greater extent than other parts of the city. In this regard, you should keep in the back of your mind the services that the bid is supposed to provide. Uh, first is cleaning, including sidewalk, sweeping, litter removal, emptying trash cans, graffiti removal. The second is maintenance, including snow clearing, weed removal, and targeted landscaping. The third is safety, including trafficking, uh, tracking unusual activity and being the eyes and ears of the police. And the fourth is marketing and public relations and economic development, which includes the ambassador program. Um, the speakers you'll hear from this evening will present information showing definitively that the MI properties are not in greater need of these services in other parts of the city. In fact, there are many parts of the city in much greater need of these services than are the MI properties. Therefore, the applicants request you to be granted. With that, I'd like to introduce the speakers in favor of the application, my colleague, Mr. Jeff Rother, and Mr. Brian Sherrick, and Mr. Hank Sherrick, both of whom are associated with the ownership and the operation of the MI properties. Um, we are, of course, available to answer any questions that you may have throughout the hearing. One thing I would ask the clerk to do, we have put all of our statements and uh, the exhibits and the various letters and, and objections together into a thing and it's asked that it be handed out. Thank you very much. With that, I will introduce Mr. Jeff Rother. Before you, before you stop the clock, since uh, I want to make sure that 
your own minds are clear on this. Uh, the proponents have 36 minutes. I'm going to ask each of the people who signed up as a part of that, do you agree to limit yourselves within this 36 minutes? So I don't want you guys to get down to 36 and somebody says, well, I didn't get a chance to speak. Clear? So William Bryan, Jeffrey Roller was speaking, Brian, Brian Sherrick, Hank Sherrick, Joe McClintock, Don Timberlake, and George Davis. All of you agreed to the rules that you allow within the 36 minutes. Is that correct? Does anybody disagree? Okay, for the record, everybody agrees to that. Thank you. Go ahead, Jeff. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Rother. Uh, I'm an attorney from Morningstar Law Group. Uh, my purpose for being here today is to introduce evidence we collected, which shows that other areas of the city are in greater need uh, than the MI properties of the clean and safe services being provided in the bid. Um, first, I, I collected and organized crime data using the community crime map feature available from LexisNexis. Uh, this is a resource that's also available to the public through the City of Durham's website. Uh, the community crime map uh, is a, a tool that allows a user to search for and identify reported police events occurring within a specific distance of a particular property within a specific period of time. For example, you could search 101 City Hall Plaza to see the reported police events occurring within a certain distance of City Hall within a defined period of time. When I say a police event, uh, this data includes everything from violent crimes and weapons violations to things like towed vehicles and general calls for service. Um, First, uh, I ran a search on the Community Crime Map website to identify all police events in the last year within 500 feet of each of the MI properties. Uh, the results are reflected on this slide here. As you can see, the results vary with some properties having as few as three reported events within 500 feet and others having as many as 32. Uh, the average across the MI properties, as reflected on the bottom of the chart, was approximately 14 reported police events for the entire year. Second, I ran the same search for other addresses within city limits. This search included properties inside the bid, as well as business centers outside of the bid. The results of those searches are reflected on this next slide. Outside of the bid, I ran searches on 3438 Hillsborough, which is a university shopping center, which reported 87 events. 1804 North Point Drive is the North Point Shopping Center, 55 events. Next is the Hope Valley Shopping Center, 80 events. The shopping center at 2220 North Roxborough Street, 87 events. 2000 Chapel Hill Road is the Lakewood Shopping Center. There were 71 events. And then also inside the bid, 309 West Morgan Street is Carolina Theater. There were 57 reported events. 321 West Gear Street is the Pitt Barbecue Restaurant. There are 58 events. 409 Blackwell is a DBAP, 22 events. 112 East Main Street is the, uh, the two-floor building that houses our law firm. There are 65 events. And 101 East Chapel Hill Street is the cupcake shop on the corner of Chapel Hill and Main. And there were 75 events. I have all the underlying data here in, in separate documents with us. We can provide that upon request. Uh, from this data, one thing is clear, that MI properties are not in a dangerous location, and there certainly is no greater need for the safe services on these properties than in other parts of the city. Next, I want to address the, the clean services that are provided to properties in the bid. On the morning of August 25th, 2017, I traveled to certain business areas in the city and took pictures of conditions which I considered to be in greater need of the cleaning and maintenance services provided in the bid. These pictures were all taken over the course of two hours. I did not have to search far to find business areas that are in need of additional cleaning and maintenance. This first slide was from Old East Durham, the corner of Angier Avenue and Driver Street. You can see overgrown weeds that are pervasive on the sidewalk and throughout the area. The next slide is in the same location. You can see the weeds again and, and the refuse on the side of the storefronts. You can see the litter that is collected along the curb on the right-hand side there. I went to the, the Lakewood Shopping Center off Chapel Hill Road. Um, in this 
first picture, you can see the litter and the dirty conditions on the walkway. There was also graffiti on the side of the building. There was a, a pedestrian area with a, a broken picnic table and an unemptied garbage pan, uh, can surrounded uh, by crushed beer cans. Uh, there was trash throughout the parking lot and the public sidewalks were covered in pine straw. I then walked uh, down the sidewalk in a business area on North Roxborough Street. In this area, you could see the significant amounts of litter near the roadside. Again, in the same location by the public sidewalks, the landscaping uh, was dead and there was uh, also a significant amount of litter. Um, these, these slides are, are not meant as a knock on the quality of these properties or these neighborhoods. But the point is that the need for services like litter removal, weed removal, maintenance, and landscaping are common to all businesses in the city. And most importantly, that there are many areas in the city which are in greater need of the bids clean services than the MI properties. Accordingly, we submit it is not possible for you to find that the MI properties are in need of the services provided by the bid to a greater extent than the other areas of the city. With that, I would like to turn things over to Mr. Brian Sherrick, who will discuss the operation of the MI properties. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Brian Sherrick. I'm the director of real estate for Measurement Incorporated. I'm responsible for overseeing facility operations for each of the MI21, each of the, the 21 MI properties. Um, those properties are identified by address and parcel number on page nine of the letter sent by Morningstar Law Group on July 14th, 2017. That is exhibit four to the agenda packet. Most of the MI properties are office buildings, but there are a couple of retail businesses operating from MI properties as well. The purpose, my purpose here tonight is to discuss the clean and safe services that are made available to properties in the bid, including the MI properties. Those services are listed in exhibit three of the agenda packet, generally, there are two types of services being provided in the bid. One, services designated to promote public safety, i.e. the eyes and ears of the police. And two, services designated to promote cleanliness in downtown, sweeping, trash removal, weed removal, emptying trash cans. As a person responsible for operations on the MI property, I can say clearly that MI properties are not in need of clean and safe services provided in the bid. The MI properties certainly are not in greater need of those services than other portions of the city. First, we provide our own clean, ser clean services for MI properties. Our staff, we have 10 full-time janitorial employees and five full-time maintenance and facility, maintenance and landscape employees. Our staff already perform all of the clean services that the bid is supposed to be performing. Our staff monitor and clean sidewalks on the MI campus daily. They remove the public litter found on the property. In the winter months, our staff remove snow and ice from the sidewalks and handicap cutouts. They empty public trash cans and clean the public benches daily, and they maintain the landscaping in and around the public sidewalk. We take pride in the appearance of our property and work diligently to make sure they are clean for our employees, our visitors, and the public. As you will see from the pictures in the PowerPoint, the sidewalks, trash cans, benches, and other public areas near the property are clean and well maintained. This picture is, is of the north entrance of the measure, measurement building and shows typical landscaping on our property. This picture is looking south on Morris Street near the intersection of Corporation and Morris. Sidewalks are clean, grass is well kept, no litter. This picture is also looking south it is 
close to the measurement building up near the corner of Hunt Street. Once again, well-maintained and clean. Other things you will find, you will notice, is that these pictures, there's very little public foot traffic in and around the MI properties. These properties are located in the northernmost section of the bid, are mostly office properties, and do not receive heavy foot tra traffic you will see in other areas of the bid that have lots of restaurants, bars, hotels, retail shops. Each of these pictures were taken between 1 and 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. You can see that no one else is on the street. With less public foot traffic, there is less litter and thus less need for a clean services as compared to other parts of the bid and the city in general. This photograph was taken on the boundary of the bid district on Washington Street. The picture, oops, let me do one more. The picture on the left looks north into the area outside the bid with no clean and safe services, where no clean and safe services are being provided. The picture on the right looks south into an area where clean and safe services are provided. You will see there's no material difference between the properties in the bid and those just outside the bid in terms of the cleanliness. With respect to graffiti removal, exhibit three of the agenda packet states that the graffiti removal services are provided only for public infrastructure. We have not experienced much graffiti on our buildings. The last event I, I can recall was 2013. Uh, it was the backside of the Brody Duke building before we cleaned the undergrowth from the Beltline. However, we do not see the value in the service if it does not apply uniformly to all properties in the bid. This property in the picture um, was spray painted over a year ago and has not been cleaned. Overall, MI properties are in no greater need of clean services than properties in other parts of the city. We keep our properties clean, we keep them well maintained, they are not located in high traffic areas that need this level of enhanced service. I will briefly, uh, I would be, be briefly regarding the safe services because Mr. Rother already um, shown a number of police events in the vicinity of our property is very low compared to other parts of the bid and other parts of the city in general. In the last nine years, um, I've been working at these properties. I can only recall a handful of crime-related events um, across all of our properties. Um, for example, on occasion, we've had cars getting broken into, we've had to call the police for assistance with panhandling, we've had a couple of breaking and entering incidents. We take public safety very seriously. Our properties are safe. We are certainly not in greater need of a security than other parts of the city. First, we have our, oops, too far. Uh, first, we have our own security staff that monitors the MI property. We have five full-time employees, security employees, so we have at least one, one person on campus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There is no need for the ambassador to serve as the eyes and ears of the police because we have our own eyes and ears. Our security team is equipped with a mobile battery starter and can provide jump start assistance to any driver in our parking lot who needs assistance. I'm not aware of any stranded drivers on our property because we are always, always there to help. With respect to the public relations checks provided by the bid, they appear to be redundant, a redundant service provided by the downtown bike patrol. That being said, we also have people on site 24 seven to help tenants and assist the public. In addition to our security, our janitorial, our maintenance and landscaping staff, that I already mentioned, we have three separate people on the property management team. That's 23 people on the MI property ready to help. In summary, we have our own 24, we have people here 24 seven to monitor activity, 
to help those in need and contact the police if necessary. The MI properties are not in greater need of extra security services than the rest of the city. I would like to address one last thing in closing. It has been suggested that we are providing duplicate services to what, the, what is provided by DDI in the bid. And the fact that we are doing this work ourselves shows that we need help. I strongly disagree with that view. We keep, out, we keep our properties clean, safe, well-maintained because it's good business. We take pride in our properties and our community. In other words, we do not need services designed to revitalize this area of the city because MI, along with other property owners in our area like us, have already revitalized this part of the city and our businesses are thriving. Thank you. Next, Hank Cherick will speak. Hello, council members. <clears throat> I'm Hank Sherrick. I live at 11 Barrington Place in Durham, <clears throat> and I'm the um, uh, person and owner of Measurement Incorporated, and I speak on behalf of all the properties listed uh, on your um, thing, whether it's with <clears throat> um, Measurement Durham or LLCs. <clears throat> so I said to say that I have opposed uh, having uh, the bid properties, and, and that's been well known. Um, and, uh, and I, but I don't want to go through all that here tonight with you. Um, I think that the services that are uh, provided by the bid would benef um, um, do not benefit MI properties. I believe uh, that has been proven tr here, true here tonight. Tonight, you have heard that the safe and clean services provided by DDI for MI property are minuscule and redundant to those provided by our employees for uh, our employees, for our tenants, for our clients, and by association with other property owners in our area because our security uh, drifts over into the other properties in our area. <clears throat> According to the DDI financial records provided to us by the city on August the 25th in response to our request for documents, uh, approximately 46% of DTI's budget is spent on safe and clean. Our previous speakers have shown that this service for MI is insufficient and unnecessary and should be discontinued. My purpose here tonight is not to rehash that, but to address the other services that DDI is supposed to provide, uh, economic development and marketing for the properties in the bid. The economic development and marketing services portion of DDI constitutes about 11% of their budget. I can clearly say that MI properties are not in need of any of these services, even if they're provided by the bid. Measure the MI properties are certainly not in greater need of services, these services, than, than other portions of the city. As shown by Mr. Rosser's uh, slides, there are many areas of our city which have severe economic needs. Of course, you already know this. Downtown Durham, by contrast, is doing very well. It has reached a point where, from a marketing standpoint, it is self sufficient. In real estate terms, it's one of the hottest areas in the research triangle. Additionally, many other public and private entities uh, market and otherwise promote economic development in the bid area. For example, the Chamber of Commerce, the Durham Visitors uh, and Convention Bureau, Brightleaf Square, Durham Central Park, and many others market the downtown area. And all, and all promote growth in downtown. Private real estate agents also provide this service. From the standpoint of MI properties, 
We engage in our own marketing of our properties that are vacant or that are underdeveloped, and those are already then those that are already occupied do not need any marketing or economic development. While our, pro while our properties are uh, vacancies are very few, we spend more each year in marketing than DDI, and certainly the value of our work with the Durham ID is greater than DDI spends on all of its economic development functions. <clears throat> Frankly, the city's, the city's willingness to engage in public-private partnerships, such as the one it entered into in order to assist the Durham ID district, is much more efficient from an economic development and marketing than anything undertaken by the bid, and it is more helpful to MI properties because it actually gets projects started. The form of marketing done by the bid is diffused, it's untrackable, and has no value to MI properties. Finally, find your cool brand that bid has worked so hard to establish is of no benefit to MI properties. It may benefit other parts of the city where bars and clubs are located, but it is not the type of slogan that applies to business tenants of any kind who occupy MI properties. In short, there's nothing in the economic development and marketing effort of the bid which benefits MI properties, and it's certainly not possible to say that those properties are in greater need of those services than any other part of the city. To the contrary, all one needs to do is consider the materials presented here tonight, and, and you will see the other areas of the, of the city where those efforts could be better spent. Thank you for your attention. Once again, I'm Bill Bryan. I'm the attorney for the applicant. As you consider the information that's been presented to you tonight, is it important to focus on the statutory standard that applies? The question, again, is not whether you want the MI properties to be in the bid so the taxes they pay can subsidize activities that are occurring in other parts of the bid. That is not how the bid is supposed to work. The services provided are supposed to be provided to all the properties in the bid equally. The finding that you must make tonight is that the MI properties are in need of the services, facilities, or functions of the bid, quote, to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city, unquote. That is a direct quote from Section 160A, 538.1A1 of the General Statutes. What you've heard tonight shows clearly that the MI properties are not in need of the bid services to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city. <clears throat> to the contrary, the MI properties do not need any of the services provided by the bid at all, either because those services are not relevant to the use of the MI properties or because the owners already provide those services for those properties at a level far in excess to what the bid applies, supplies. Excuse me. All the services provided by the bid are needed to make to a much greater extent in northeast central Durham. They are needed to a much greater extent along North Roxborough Street. They are needed much great, to a much greater extent in Lakewood, and they are even needed to a much greater extent in other parts of the bid, but they are not needed by the MI properties. The purpose of the bid is to charge extra taxes to property owners who need and will receive enhanced services. It is not to charge extra taxes to property owners who do not need those services in order to subsidize the provision of services to other property owners who do need those services. The bid is not supposed to be a means to redistribute wealth from one property owner to another property owner. We all want a clean and safe downtown, and our clients already pay substantial taxes, which are used to provide services to ensure that we will have a clean and, clean and safe downtown. They should not be required to pay extra bid taxes because they neither need nor receive the extra services the bid is supposed to provide. In short, the owners of the MI properties have shown definitively that the MI properties are not in need of the bid services to a demonstrably, to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city, again quoting from the statute. 
Therefore, they respectfully request that their properties be removed from the bid pursuant to NCGS 160A-538.1, print A1, close print. We'll be glad to answer any questions you may have about any of the materials presented this evening by any of the speakers, either for or against. I suppose we will retain whatever time we have if we need to answer questions or otherwise rebut things that others may say. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Can you stop the clock? Let me ask other questions by members of the council of the proponent this time. If not, we'll proceed with those who are sound speaking opposition to the removal. I've, as I call your names, you can come to the podium to the right. Each speaker has three minutes. Nicole Thompson, Lou Myers, Michael Goodman, Tucker Bartlett, Adam Klein, Justin Parker, Larry Tillery, Alice Sharp, Seth Gross, Jeff Durham, Scott Harmon, Melissa Muir. Is anyone's name who would sign up to speak to this name I didn't call? I, should, I thought I saw your name in here somewhere. Huh. Well, if you can just. Okay. And who, who else was? All right. So if you can begin speaking, if you state your name and address again, please. Good evening, Mayor Bill. Honorable members of City Council, my name is Nicole Thompson. I am the President and CEO of Downtown Durham, Inc. at 115 Market Street in Downtown Durham. Downtown Durham, Inc. DDI respectfully submits this response in opposition to the request by Measurement Incorporated, MI, to remove its properties from the Municipal Service District, MSD, known as the Durham Business Improvement District bid. DDI, a nonprofit corporation operating the bid under contract with the City of Durham, urges the city to preserve the bid intact for the benefit of the citizens of Durham. It is DDI's position that MI's request is improper for essentially two reasons. First, MI cannot make the statutorily required showing regarding the bid's services, facilities, and functions. This failure warrants the denial of the request without further consideration. Second, even if one assumes that MI can make such a showing under the statute, the council has broad discretion to disallow a request from removal from an, from an MSD. The legislature has provided guidance concerning how the council should consider requests like the one now presented by MI. The city's statutorily prescribed duties are as follows. The city must hold a public hearing and determine whether the property owner has made the required showing in light of all of the comments received at the hearing. At that hearing, the property owner bears the burden of providing that the track or parcel in question is not in need of the services, facilities, or functions of the district to a demonstrable greater extent than the remainder of the city. This is the statutorial test. Two, if and only if the city determines that the requester has made the required showing, the city must exercise its discretion in ruling on the request. Regardless of the requester's showing, the city has absolutely no obligation to remove any parcel from an MSD. If the track or parcel is found to meet the test, the council may, but is not required to, remove the parcels from the MSD. MI has shown neither that its land was erroneously incorporated in bid or that circumstances have changed since the bid was created. MI does not argue in its letter that its properties do not qualify for inclusion in the bid under the MSD statute, and it offers no legitimate basis for changing the bid now. To create an MSD in North Carolina, a municipality must find that the district is in need of one or more services to be provided by the MSD. In 2011, the city of Durham specifically found, in connection with its adoption of the bid, that the district is in need of one or more services to be provided by the MSD. MI presents no arguments or evidence that this determination was incorrect at the time this body made it. The only basis for disturbing that decision now would be a change in circumstances that renders the decision inappropriate after the passage of time. MI has merely stated that its parcels meet the test. Its argument, um, excuse me, MI bears the heavy burden of showing that despite the lack of error or change since adoption of the bid, its parcels nonetheless meet the test. In its letter to this council, MI's arguments boil down to two points. One, that MI's own services duplicate those provided by the bid, 
and two, that certain services provided by the bid are also provided by other organizations. The landowner's decision to provide duplicate services does not address the land-based test. There are two primary reasons for the statute's focus on the track or parcel of land rather than the need of individual landowners. First, the public benefits of an MSD are tied to its geographic contigu contiguity. Without a reliable basic standard of additional services within a contiguous area, the benefits of an MSD become too inconsistent to provide assurances to workers, residents, and visitors that the MSD area is reliably maintained and serviced to district standards. The MSD statute contemplates that an MSD may provide services. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Lou Myers. I'm um, chair of the board of DDI and reside at 208 Rigsby Avenue, number 104. Uh, the city should exercise its broad discretion to deny the request. Despite MI's failure to show its parcels meet the test, DDI also addresses below why, even if MI had met the statutory test for removal, the city of Durham need not and should not remove the MI parcels from the bid as a matter of policy. As DDI must maintain contiguity to provide consistent benefits, the DDI benefits to downtown Durham include economic development, as was stated earlier. Our bid marketing services focus exclusively on the downtown bid area. Our marketing efforts center on establishing a strong and robust entertainment, retail, food, and art environment and attracting new investment and development opportunities downtown. Should this message be altered to remove, delete, or refrain from mentioning specific parcels and addresses, it weakens the entire message and distorts the overall image of the bid. Uh, revitalization includes areas of uh, downtown. Our services are commensurate with increased users. The bid area contains a, continues to grow as a primary destination area, and as a result, downtown has experienced a marked increase in pedestrian activity. There also has been significant increase in the number of downtown residents, drawn in part by employment opportunities, to better nurture these activities within the bid and effectively support the increases in pedestrian activity, there is a demonstrable need to ensure that special enhanced services are offered, such as increased street level appearance and hospitality services. The success of Durham's downtown area is well documented since creation of the bid. Since 2011, there has been a 58% increase in the number of street level businesses, 170% increase in the number of hotel rooms, a 66% increase in the number of residential units, and property value has increased by 90% from just under 900 billion to now 1.7 billion. Uh, fairness requires the MI parcels remain a part of the bid. The services and activities are provided within the bid are paid by all and benefit all. The removal of an individual parcels within the bid increases the possibility of benefits being enjoyed by a non-bid paying entities and diluting the overall impact of the services offered. This becomes an equity issue. Is it just and fair for a property owner to benefit from its location within the heart of the well-maintained downtown area and that property owner not be required to provide its proportional amount to the bid sustainability? Thank you. Evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, thank you for giving us a few moments here. Um, Michael Goodman, 3900 Hope Valley Road. Also, unfortunately, 3718 Eaton Road. If you need a house, give me a call. Um, that's really the only reason I'm here. Uh, uh, DDI has been critical to what we've all, all of us in this room, have gotten done in downtown Durham over many years. And while it used to take the form, such a beautiful form of Bill Kalkoff, you know, it now takes a form of, of Nicole, our fearless leader, but not only her, but these great people right here who work hard every day in our our community to help make it safer and cleaner. And we're grateful for that. And while the scope might have changed and the focus might have changed somewhat, you know, the, the, the core mission and the, and the critical nature of what they do is still there. When, bid, when Bill Kalkoff asked me to co-chair 
working on getting public support of the bid some years ago. I, I surprisingly was excited to do it, surprisingly, because I knew I'd have to listen to Bill's pontifications more so than I usually would have to, one. Bill's probably watching, hey Bill. Uh, but number two, because I knew that it played to our greatest trait, and that is that our, all of our beliefs, that we're in this together, that a rising tide does in fact float all boats. And I think that's really our fundamental trait as a community that's made us the passionate and caring community we've become today. See, I love the concept of the bid. The bid's perfect for me. Because at the end of the day, what the bid represents is that the greatest form of economic development is in fact community development. That's what we're all here doing, right? And the notion that we as the community understand reinvesting in our community and the power of that, that in creating economic success for all is really a critical thing. And for us to be here actually begging to pay you taxes is, is a funny thing, but the notion that the property owners from downtown get together and say, this is important, we're willing to reinvest, that's something that can't be overlooked. You know, without a doubt, everyone's benefited, uh, and we know that. And the bid's not about keeping score. If that's the goal, then we're working on the wrong things. Rather, it's about the success of the whole downtown, the success of all, and in turn, the success of us individually. This is what I know to be true. Downtown Durham has come a really, really, really long way. And we have some very, very important debates and some very important discussions to have as we move forward. That's for sure. But to say it simply, the value of the bid isn't one of them. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tucker Bartlett, live at 705 Cobb Street and work for self-help at 301 West Main Street. I first want to appreciate and thank Hank. Uh, and your team, Brian, for all that y'all have done downtown. As the recent new book came out called Becoming Durham, nicknamed Hank, he was the first. So real appreciation to everything that y'all have done. Uh, tonight, unfortunately, I'm, I've got several points to make where we're not in agreement on our, with our respected friends here on this issue. And basically three points. As a real estate professional who has developed and financed many properties inside the bid and outside the bid, I think it's a bit absurd to try to think of yourself as an island, and to say that these 21 properties do not benefit directly from all of the bid services and are not part of a larger location that is in need of the bid. The existing uh, campus and the emerging innovation <coughs> are direct beneficiaries of the, of the success of downtown Durham, just like the rest of us. Self-help currently pays six cents per square foot for the bid. We receive a benefit at least 10 times greater than that for the fact that we are in a clean, safe, and vibrant downtown. And we are all equally in need of, of being in downtown for our businesses to survive, to be financially sustainable. So it's, it's absurd to think that, um, that Measurement Inc. does not need to charge the rental rates that are consistent with rental rates downtown. You can't think of yourself, if, this, if Measurement Inc.'s properties were not located downtown, but were some of the areas that we saw in the photos, um, to say that they would be able to succeed in charging those rental rates to justify the new development they're, they're doing. It's silly to think that the tenants in their buildings are not requiring the life of being able to walk out of their door and go get a cupcake from Anna or get a panini from Kelly at Toast. They are part of a larger environment, just like the rest of us, that benefit from what we've created in that environment. The second point is because they're large, like self-help, we employ janitors, maintenance, security, all ourselves as well. But that doesn't mean we think we should pull out. If each of us as large property owners decided, hey, we do this ourselves, we have economies of scale, we don't need it, and we pulled out, we would put the whole burden of our larger downtown on our smaller businesses. Do we want Dorian and Ryan and Anna to be the people that pay taxes while the larger people say, hey, we got it on our own, we don't need you. That to me seems unfair. It's like being part of South Point Mall or a condo association and say, I don't want to pay my dues. I don't want to pay my common area maintenance, but I do like being part of this overall nice community. The other argument has been made that we don't need DDI anymore, that, this, that, that downtown is done or their services are redundant with other organizations that done, have done that. It's a best practice across the state, across this nation, to have a group that is full-time focused on our downtown. The minute we stop focusing on our downtown is the minute our downtown starts to die. So we're all in this together. We're happy to pay our taxes, and we hope others will too. Thank you.
Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Adam Klein. I live at 1916 Bivens Street and work at the American Underground. We have three locations in downtown Durham, uh, two on Main Street and one at Blackwell Street. Um, I am the chief strategist at the American Underground, and we're a campus for entrepreneurs that houses about 275 early stage startups. Um, we've had some good success in the past few years in terms of telling the story of the entrepreneurs uh, who are here, but much of that success has been due to the fact that they're a part of a bustling downtown. They are part of a larger story that's happening in Durham. Uh, it's not just the entrepreneurial community itself. And they're here because entrepreneurs and creatives want to be part of a lively, vibrant, and authentic downtown, exactly the kind of place that DDI, in partnership with the city, has led in creating. From fantastic restaurants and bars to budding retail to lively music in the streets, downtown has come a long way, and we still have a long way to go. Our voice, American Underground's voice in marketing and sharing these wins and these stories have been largely about the startup community, but DDI's voice is about the entirety of downtown and the entirety of the downtown story. And we're grateful for their marketing and their expertise in doing that. It's been suggested that, that downtown is hot and that we need not spend more money there. But I'd suggest that uh, in the world of marketing, when you're hot, you want to put more resources and more effort into that. We've got a good thing going. It's not time to let up on the gas. Our future lies in a collective group of businesses, city officials, and nonprofits working shoulder to shoulder to build a downtown in a city that is diverse, robust, and dynamic. We cannot do this in isolation, and we cannot do it separately. We will do it by working together. There is much work to be done, and the bid is a key component of getting to where we need to go. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Justin Parker. I'm with Wexford Science and Technology, and I'm here tonight uh, to speak in support of the bid. And we're located at, uh, at the Chesterfield Building, 701 West Main Street in Durham. Since purchasing the Chesterfield Building in 2013, we have seen very significant and tangible benefits from the bid. Tonight, I'll speak about those benefits that we have seen. But I'd like to say I think that this conversation is much less about one individual property owner's benefits um, one business's benefits and about the benefit of the whole of downtown. Since we purchased the building, Downtown Durham, Inc. has been an incredible asset and ally and partner for us from our first days of community engagement through working through design and planning, through all of the twists and turns that occur during a development to now preparing to open the, business, the building to the public uh, later this year. They have been a staunch advocate and ally as they have for a number of business businesses and property owners that are represented here tonight. <clears throat> we believe that the services that the bid offers are critical for creating, for creating one cohesive downtown with one image and for first impressions. As we bring investors or tenant prospects or future business partners into the city, it's critically important that, that downtown is, is cohesive and clean and safe, and we believe the bid does an excellent job of ensuring that throughout, throughout downtown. We've talked tonight, we've talked tonight about how downtown is, is hot, and, and it is, and look, and, 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 and we're all in here benefiting um, from that, but to suggest that because we've seen success um, means it's time to take the foot off the gas, we think is, uh, is very misguided. We think, in fact, it's uh, it, it's quite the opposite. And when you're seeing the type of success that we've been blessed and lucky to have um, in recent years, that's when uh, it's time to put your foot on the gas and, uh, and and look around and say, you know what, what, what we've been doing is working, and it's time to take it to the next level. And we think the bid and DDI and the services are critical to that. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, my name is Larry Tilly. I live at 1012 West Markham. My business is Acme Plumbing. And we're located at 636 Foster Street. Uh, my business uh, has been in Durham since 1947. I, I didn't start that. My grandfather did. But uh, we moved downtown in 1964 and bought property in 1984 and located where we are currently. Uh, in 1984, the downtown area was doing pretty, pretty badly. And uh, since DDI started and since uh, the downtown started moving forward uh, and the bid ultimately got passed, uh, I've seen dramatic improvements in that area. 
uh, when uh, back in 1985, 86, Walker Stone came to me and said, we got to hire a security guard just to keep our individual properties protected. And so a group of us paid money to, to hire uh, a, just a security guard to ride around our properties back in the 80s, early 80s. We don't have to do that now. We still have a lot of people that we've attracted because of the developments. And I think uh, it's in uh, a great benefit for the, the area. The, uh, I intend to develop our, my property there on, uh, on Foster Street, uh, hopefully in the near future. And I think that the bid is a tremendous asset uh, for any development down there. Thank you. Good evening, Council Mayor. My name is Alice Sharp, and I live at 208 Rigsby Avenue, where I own a small condo. You have heard or will hear how downtown has changed for the better. Transformation, revitalization, our words heard a lot these days. Much of that success and thanks go to Hank Sherrick and his early belief in downtown as a location for his business, Measurement Inc. Hank has not been just a good community neighbor. Hank has been a great community neighbor. For every one thing you hear that Hank has done for our downtown neighborhood, there are one or two things that he has done quietly and unselfishly for all of us. So it pains me that I find myself on the opposite side of this issue from Hank, but I am. I'm not here to talk about downtown's past. I am laser focused on downtown's future. And you can help with that today. A future that will not be fully realized unless we keep an intact bid. Mm -hmm. If council approves an, any exception to the bid for property owners, there will be a floodgate of property owners leaving the bid. And this will set a precedent mm -hmm. that we won't be able to recover from. Owners will remove themselves from the bid. While we have come a long way, downtown is not there yet. Let me repeat that. Downtown is not there yet by a long shot. If we judge ourselves from where we've come from, anything looks good. And we already know we can do much better than anything. Downtown can be so much more than we can even imagine today. An intact bid helps us to realize that good enough is too low a bar for Durham and for downtown. With an intact bid, all benefit from increased economic development, a broader tax base, creation of good jobs for Durham citizens, and a safe, desirable community in which to live, work, and play. This body has made historic decisions when it comes to how downtown has evolved. And that starts with Durham Bulls Athletic Park, the Durham Performing Arts Center, and then the Business Improvement District. Please let this not be the day when the vision of a great downtown began to fade. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council. Uh, my name is Jeff Durham. I spent a fair amount of time, about three years or so, uh, working with uh, Downtown Durham, Inc. I uh, now work across the street over at the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Um, I actually kind of see the other side of this coin. Um, I see it as, as downtown Durham continues to grow. I think there's an increased need for the bid services really to safeguard the billions, billions and billions of dollars of, of public and private investment that have occurred over the past couple of decades. Bid services like street cleaning and maintenance, public safety and hospitality, marketing events, beautification projects, Think of them less as like clean and safe services and more as like asset management, and they provide a, protect, a protection for the past investments that you all have spent. In addition to these important placemaking programs, bids provide advocacy and business development services specifically to the downtown district. Simply put, downtown Durham still needs a champion, 
and the bid specifically fills that need. I heard a little bit about sort of the duplicitous efforts between uh, some of the marketing and economic development initiatives that the Durham Chamber and DDI um, take on. Durham Chamber and DDI work in a hand in glove relationship as it pertains to marketing and ED work. And while the, uh, the chamber does inform like of demand generators, growth sectors, business recruitment, retention, and expansion, think of DDI as sort of the entity that provides the structure that ultimately we'll be populating those entities with. So DDI and the bid market to structure, um, and the chamber actually markets to what ends up populating that. DDI is focused on providing commercial inventories exclusively to the downtown, while the chamber has a more broad uh, countywide focus. The bid serves a critical niche in marketing, business development, and advocacy, and I encourage you all to support the bid and vote against the exclusion of any parcels within the district. Any removal of parcels within the district will set an adverse precedent that would undermine the decades of downtown investment. Thank you. Hey everybody, good evening and thank you for your time tonight. My name is Scott Harmon. My business partner and I own a small architecture studio at Five Points, uh, 107 East Chapel Hill Street. I have been either working or living in downtown for 17 years. I'm thinking back to 2011 and before, the public trash cans were not emptied regularly. The green rolling garbage carts lived permanently on the sidewalks. Our recently completed streetscape improvements were deteriorating from lack of maintenance. Trash, leaves, and weeds were a dominant feature of our streetscape. The impact of illegal dumping was felt in empty lots behind buildings and around our garbage facilities. It's important to remember what that downtown was like because that is not the downtown Durham we have today. And it is precisely because of the work of DDI and their clean and safe subcontractors. Our studio is by any measure a small business. We have four full-time employees. When the improvement district was proposed in 2010, myself and the vast majority of other small businesses and small property owners saw an opportunity to come together and make an additional investment in downtown. By pooling our smaller resources with those of larger landowners, we could create something more powerful than the sum of the parts. We can enjoy services that small businesses cannot afford on our own. We can reinvest some of the rewards of our increased property values back into our community. We can support the tireless work of our economic leaders to make sure that we continue building the homes, workspaces, stores, parks, and jobs that are foundational to any great city. The Improvement District is a fair, effective system. It is the best practice utilized across North Carolina and the US. The community debated the matter openly and fairly. Not everyone agreed, but the consensus was clear, and we made this decision fair and square as a community. The, imp the Improvement District not only works, but for some of the people in this room, it has worked to a staggering degree, creating wealth and security the likes of which most of us in this room will never see. And that's okay, because we're in this all together. Thank you again for your time and for supporting the small locally owned businesses that depend on this improvement district and the numerous ways it grows our community. Thank you. Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council, I'm Melissa Muir with Downtown Durham Incorporated. Our office is located at 115 Market Street here in Downtown Durham. Uh, today, I am here to read a letter on behalf of Mario Mirabelli, who's the Vice President and Portfolio Asset Manager for LLC Properties. Dear Mayor Bell and City Council members, LRC Properties believes that the Downtown Durham Business Improvement District is an invaluable resource and tool for the ongoing revitalization of Downtown Durham. LRC is obviously new to Durham, but is a big believer and investor in the Bull City's renaissance. The Golden Belt Project and Mill No. 1 represent over $50 million of investment on the east side of Durham and includes the historic renovation of the last tobacco warehouse in downtown Durham. LRC always works with local groups wherever we invest, and DDI as the bid management organization is a perfect example of what we look for. Through the bid, DDI, the only organization solely focused on downtown development, brings tremendous energy and experience to their work and is always putting the best interest of downtown Durham first. DDI has a thorough understanding of the issues, both good and bad, confronting the downtown area 
and has the experience and knowledge to find solutions. The bid, through its economic development, marketing, events, and clean and safe services, will continue to make downtown a place people want to invest in. LRC recognizes the value of coordinated marketing and promotion, events, clean and safe services, and the continued economic development work. And because of this, we feel very optimistic about our investments in downtown Durham. Thank you for your leadership in creating the downtown Durham bid and for your investments in downtown. I personally look forward to working with the city and DDI as LRC further advances the renaissance on the east side of downtown Durham. Sincerely, Mario Mirabelli. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Good evening. and City Council. My name is Seth Gross. I own and operate three businesses in downtown Durham. And it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm here to support the bid and the folks there in the uh, turquoise shirts. I love the ambassadors and what they've done. I have retail businesses that depend on a lively city, foot traffic, cleanliness, all of the things that they provide. I, I, I'm a huge fan of what they do. They keep the, uh, the streets clean. They keep the trash out. They are really important to keeping downtown going. I often talk about how our businesses are looked at as a thread in the fabric of Durham. I love being part of the fabric of Durham, and I think a big part of that fabric is turquoise. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bell and City Council members. I'm Shelley Green. I'm President and CEO of the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau at 212 West Main Street. In 2011, the DCVB board voted to endorse the bid proposal, and that was not a slam dunk decision. We heard from Bill Kalkoff, of course, then president of DTI, DDI, but we also invited several other downtown property owners to speak to our board, including Terry Sanford Jr., uh, Rodney Allison, and Hank Sherrick. And Hank took us up on it, and he came to our meeting and spoke very passionately about uh, why he didn't think the bid was a good idea. Our board eventually voted uh, in to endorse the bid, which we did at the time, but the reason that we did that is sitting in front of you in turquoise shirts. Uh, and these men and women have done a really phenomenal job, and I'd just like to thank you uh, how great you are to our visitors that come to Durham. And they talk about you a lot. We get anywhere from 600 to 1,000 people in the Visitor Info Center every month and I can't tell you how many times they tell us, who are those people in those blue shirts? They helped me with my car. And since February, they helped me figure out the parking meters. How many times have you done that? Um, so I don't know if there's enough funding to continue the ambassador program if you exempt individual property owners. Uh, and that, that really concerns me because of what a great job they're doing. Downtown is our living room, it's our front porch, it is the heart of our community, and it's where a lot of visitors come when they, when they go to Durham. And uh, these men and women in the blue shirts have really provided great, great service to us. Um, we call them a lot for visitors that have car issues. We call them when somebody needs a safe escort to their car. That includes employees and visitors that are here at night. And, and another thing is we host a round table of festival owners and managers. There are 80 festivals that sit on that uh, event with us. And many of them, you're gonna hear from one in just a minute, have commented about how helpful the ambassadors are cleaning up the waste so that when the festival begins the next morning, things are cleaned up and, and it's, it's just a really great atmosphere uh, for us to work in. So in conclusion, I wanna thank you all for what you've done. I, I hope that the ambassador program can continue um, because it, it provides a clean and safe environment for all of us. So thank you very much uh, for your time tonight. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council members. I'm Cicely Mitchell, and I am a resident here in downtown Durham. I live at 500 North Duke Street, number 54209 at the Bullington Warehouse. And I just recently moved there, and I lived uh, downtown for four years before that at West Village. And I think that's very important 
for the discussion today, other than the fact that I'm the proud co-founder and president of the Art of Cool Festival. I've lived near these parcels for about four and a half years. Art of Cool is a local grassroots nonprofit that has a very strong economic impact and drives tourism here in downtown Durham each spring. We've gone from doing pop-up concerts in 20, 2012 to, in 2017, bringing 10,000 visitors over a weekend with a $1.8 million economic impact. Part of the success of Art of Cool is our ability to put on a fun, safe, clean, and hospitable event that is facilitated and marketed with partners like DDI. The ambassadors provided by DDI are essential to making sure the festival is clean. The bid assists with resources providing for the ambassadors and without these services and bid resources, it would be difficult for Art of Cool or any other festival for that matter to offer the same level of cleanliness and quality that our visitors and artists have come to enjoy within the past four years. I do want to state, because I originally came up here to talk about um, my role with Art of Cool and how the bid does affect that, but I do live near Measurement, Inc., and so I do need to make a statement. I'm a resident, lives very near these parcels, and I've lived there for four years at West Village and recently moved to the Bullington. And although the MI vans cruise very near to these places late night, I did experience a break-in in my car just this summer. Who doesn't need more eyes and ears? We always need extra eyes and ears. And so I do want to make the statement that they said they've got it from here. And just living there, that's one break-in too many, even though they do have minivans that come around at night. My car did get broken into. Thank you. That, that concludes the persons who had uh, signed up to speak in opposition. Uh, we added two more speakers, six minutes, so I've asked the clerk to add six minutes to the opposition, uh, to the proponents, if you care to use it. Just very briefly, Mr. Mayor, Bill Bryan, attorney for the uh, applicants again. Um, very, it's very important. There, are a lot of, there was a lot of talk in the statements that were made uh, by the people opposing the application about what happened in 2011 and how the bid was put together in 2011 and what the, the status of the law was in 2011. The law changed. The law changed. And, and uh, the statute that we've been operating under here tonight um, NCGS 158.1A1 was enacted, which specifically creates the standard that you are supposed to be fi making findings in accordance with this evening. That standard being that the property in question is demonstrably in need, greater need of the services provided by the bid than other parts of the city. <clears throat> so what I didn't hear much of in the opposition was any reference to the standard or any evidence about the standard and about why the MI properties, which are the properties in question here tonight, are demonstrably in need of greater services of the services that are provided by the bid. Um, it's important, this is an important point to focus on because this is not about the bid per se. It's not about whether the bid should exist or the bid should not exist. This is about whether these properties should be within the bid. And, whether, and, and, and I would go back to what you said, Mr. Reese, earlier this evening, uh, as well as what some of the folks who spoke here tonight said. You said nobody who, who doesn't want to be a part of the city should be, should be made to be a part of the city. Well, I would suggest that you extend that analogy to say that nobody who doesn't want to be a part of the bid should be made to be a part of the bid. And that's, that's essentially what the statute says. The statute says that if you, don't, if, if you don't want to be a part of the bid, you have the right to ask to be let go. And that's, what, and that's what we're doing here tonight. We're, we're making that request. Um, the other comment that was made was that if you, if you let MI go and the MI properties go from the bid, that there'll be a floodgate of people who want out of the bid. If that's the case, then why do we have a bid? 
Apparently, the people who are in it don't want to be in it. Uh, we've heard a lot from people who are, who are uh, the, the, the leaders of the nonprofits that, that are paid for with the money that's, that comes from the bid here tonight, but we haven't heard much from the property owners in the bid, um, and therefore, that, 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 that argument doesn't seem to me to be very relevant. Now, the last thing I would do, and I have to do this for the record, um, I have to, I was told by the city attorney that, that it was not appropriate to lobby you on this matter. And so I would like to ask whether the members of the council have received communications from other, from any of the people from outside communications outside of this, outside of this hearing relating to this matter. And I'm asking that for, as a matter of, for the records, because I have a feeling that this matter is going to continue on. Let, let, let me, well, if the city attorney wants to say something, go, go ahead. I'll, I'll yield to you since it's a legal question, but I do have a comment. Go ahead. I just, because Mr. Bryan said that the city attorney said that he couldn't lobby counsel, yeah. I'd like to know if he's talking about me or yeah, Fred. It was, it was you and Fred. Uh, you and specifically wrote me a, an email, which is part of the objection that said it was that your advice to the city council members is that it was not appropriate. To, to lobby people on public hearing matters. Okay, that, that's not accurate. And I did accurately state in my email, this had to do with the work session and whether or not there was gonna be conversation uh, about well, the we public hearing. we misunderstood each other then. Well, if you, you can reread my, my email because I was pretty clear about that, that I did not tell you you couldn't because that was the issue with the quasi-judicial nature, which is in a situation like that, the first question that you would ask in a quasi-judicial hearing is whether or not council Correct. members had been lobbied so that was that was a very different question about whether or not substantive comments would be heard at the work session on Thursday and my response to you was that it has been the historic advice from our office that we would prefer that we don't have discussions uh, substantive discussions about uh, during about a public hearing during the work session that the right, appropriate so time is to, it's, it's in the email, it's, it's uh, specified let, in the email. So the appropriate time is at the public hearing, is that correct? Yes. So is it also inappropriate to have discussions with, with members of the community outside the public hearing? You can, you can do what you want outside of the public hearing. I'm saying that at the work session, it's, it's, it's in the, e the email that I sent to you. By knowledge, nobody has been lobbying the city council on this. I don't think that would be appropriate. That's the email from Fred Lamar on August 23rd, 2017. <laughs> so you, you just you just said that I said it, but oh, well, you, never mind. You, you said it later, but it's, I, it's, I, the, it's, it's the mayor's it's meeting. Office, I'll stop. Your office. Oh. Well, I'm, the, I'm just trying to clarify for the purposes of the record since what whether that has in fact been going on, whether there's been any lobbying which has occurred. Well, let, let me speak for myself. Uh, it, it's been my practice that on public hearing matters, if a person wants to come to speak to me, either for or against it, I listen. But I make it very clear that I don't make a final decision until the public hearing. Lobbying comes in various forms. People come, come to me personally. They can write me letters, uh, such as your client did when this first came up. I got a letter saying why you wanted to get out of the, out of the bid. So lobbying comes in, in, in different forms for me. Well, you, you, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, you received a request yeah. to put this matter on the agenda, which is the way that, which is procedurally the way that it goes. But it, it came forward. with why. It came with the details of why you shouldn't which, be a part of it. It wasn't required. just, I want out. You, you came in and told, I, I'm not saying you, I'm saying the letter I got from your law firm. Yeah, I wrote it. It came with very specific re requests as to why you wanted to come before us and why you shouldn't be a, considered a part of that. You did it in writing. Uh, you could have come to me said the same thing. But to me, that's still a form of lobbying. I think what's important is for me personally, uh, no one can, can say that they had a conversation with me and they left with the impression that Bill Bell was going to support this and not support it. So that's been my practice. So if you ask him, was I lobbied? Lobbied in the form that I just, just, just indicated. Mr. Attorney, I ask a procedural question here. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate, or is it, if it's appropriate, uh, is it incumbent upon members of this council during a public hearing to respond to questions from one of the proponents for an application like this? That's that's really up to you all. It's it's unusual, but it's it's. You well, know. L l let's say this. Uh, I, I, since I'm running the meeting, uh, 
we have constantly had, my, I've raised a question from each of the council members, you have further questions of whoever, even after the time limit is gone up. If you choose to call somebody up, that, that's allowed. Uh, this was a question that was raised, and I think I have the prerogative of answering or not answering, so I was answering for myself on this particular case, uh, since he was doing it for the record. I appreciate that, and again, my question is for the record. And if you choose not to answer, that will be on the Excuse record, me. too. Man, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to interject since my email was uh, quoted as Fred Lamar with the city attorney's office. And I don't think that the substance of your request to the council um, should be based on the statement I made in my email, which at that time, if you read my emails, I, ins I insisted that this matter was a legislative um, policy judgment decision, not a quasi-judicial decision. And when you asked about speaking, my response had to do with whether or not staff members or city um, city staff would be lobbying the council. In my opinion, that's not something that is, uh, uh, is appropriate, but not because it's a quasi-judicial hearing, just because it's not something that uh, you know, I typically will see staff do. Um, in any case, it, the, the state you're hanging your hat on, my statement, arguing that in some way this is a quasi-judicial hearing, but we've made it clear to council, me and Patrick, that in our opinion, it's a legislative decision, and I think it's unfair for you to ask council whether or not they spoke to other people. Let that be uh, uh, something to argue in Superior Court if you decide to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to try to take this up. That's what I would recommend. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Council Lamar. I'd like to just make a quick statement, which is that um, uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with quasi-judicial procedures and when an item is on the agenda as quasi-judicial, we respond in a particular manner. This item was not on the agenda as a quasi-judicial matter. If you wanted to take your, and I, I believe that you probably understand the difference between those two, and that if you want to take your direction from the city attorney, that was your prerogative. But um, I will tell you that on the, I will tell you two things. The first is, is on any legislative matter, when anyone in the city, ask for my time so that they can talk to me about an issue, I always say yes. If they send me an email, I try to respond to that email. Letters, just the same as, because I I'm, I'm, believe it's incumbent on us to be available to the people of Durham. That said, I will tell you that I've had no conversations regarding uh, MI properties and the bid prior to this evening. Thank you. And I mean no offense by asking the question, but I, I, we have contended throughout the entire process, and it's a, at some length, um, that this is a should be a quasi-judicial matter, and that's why I'm, we have to make the record. And I sometimes when I have to make the record, I have to be unpleasant. My apologies. I'm, oh. Are, are there other questions or comments? By, by council. Okay. Um, Mr. Sherrick would like to make a couple of last comments. Oh. If you have any question, any other questions or comments before I no. sit down. Not. Hank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and council. Um, I, I want to uh, just make a couple of statements. First, um, the, the members of the ambassador team that are here, I have no uh, I, I applaud them for what they do. I've, I've seen them. I think they're a hard-working group. And, and so um, you guys, gals, uh, thank you for all you do in Durham. I know that when you come down our streets, you have an easy day. So <laughs> enjoy your easy days when you come down our streets. Uh, but thank you for the hard work you do. We, we, we have no question about your efforts. We appreciate that. Second, um, <clears throat> I want to uh, assure Alice Sharp that there are no hard feelings. <laughs> no. I, I, uh, I, I don't have any hard feelings, and, and we have no disagreements. All of us people, all people can disagree on issues, and this is an issue that we disagree on, but We'll, we'll be friends and have a hug when this is over. I hope. I, I hope. <clears throat> and then finally, 
I want to comment ab about people invoking the legend of Bill Kalkoff because Bill Kalkoff was the leader of DDI. He brought this uh, almost by himself. He brought DDI up and and, dur and during the time that it was a, a uh, member driven organization, he and I had no issues. As a matter of fact, I served as chair of the board of DDI for several, uh, uh, and, and was on the board for several years. Uh, where Bill and I disagreed was when the bid issue came along and DDI changed from being a membership supported organization to be a tax supported organization. And we still disagree on that. But once again, Bill Kalkoff and I serve together at this point in time on another board of directors in, in, in another effort in, in downtown. We disagree on whether DDI should be a tax supported institution group, which it is now, or whether it should have been a membership-driven group, which it was when I served on the board. So there, there are there, there's places for us to, to disagree. <clears throat> um, I think that we've made our points. As our attorneys have pointed out, we have a right under the uh, under the law to request, and we have done that. And so thank you for listening. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, ask you I have a question of Mr. Bryant. Yeah. Attorney Bryant, uh, good evening. Ma'am. When did the statute change? 2016, I believe. And could you quote it again for me? I, I did not realize that this process had. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, what, what Attorney Bryan is talking about, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, this is the addition of 160A 538.1, which creates this very process for a property owner right. to petition the council to be removed from the statute. That's, that's the change right. of the law, is what we're doing here today. Correct. So there was a request from the General Assembly to do this. To create a process by right. which okay. a property owner could okay. right. petition to be removed okay. from the. All right, thank you. I have it. I, I did want to hear from uh, the ambassadors, I, but then Hank said that they do come down the st his street, and I was going to find out if, how do you chart your work during a given day? You just, can somebody. <coughs> Answer that for me. Hey, you need to come to the microphone, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tempore. Can you please just repeat the question to me here? How, how do you determine where you go uh, within a given day? Could you state your name for the record? I'm sorry. My name is Eric Nystrom. I'm the operations manager for the ambassador program with DDI. Uh, each area or each zone, which we call in the bid, uh, is assigned to a particular ambassador uh, during the course of a shift. And so someone touches the entire bid every day? Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Okay. Thank you. I just want to Thank you. clarify that. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. The so for for clarity, I'm not sure if this has been um, clearly stated, but the ordinance that we've been referencing, 168-538.1, um, has the operative word in that ordinance is may that a property owner petitioning a request may submit a request to City Council to remove that property, and the City Council may redefine the service district by removing that tractor parcel, but it does not say that we are required to, even if the standard um, that, the, that the property does not 
need the services, facilities, or functions of the proposed district to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city is met. We just have the option to once that standard is met. That being said, I don't think that standard has been met. Um, and the argument that other areas in the city need these services more than downtown strikes me as very similar to the argument that people make against vaccines, that we don't need to vaccinate people anymore because people don't get those diseases anymore, when actually the reason they don't get the diseases anymore is, in fact, the vaccines. We can't, we can't compare the, cl the clean and safe services. We can't compare downtown services with the bid to other areas of the, of the city without the bid. That comparison doesn't make any sense. Um, I wanted to comment on the foot traffic issue because uh, the majority of the buildings that are being talked about right now are in the ID district, which is currently under construction. Phase one is under construction. Um, also, that's a tax publicly supported project, received a $5.25 million tax incentive from the city back in 2015. And these buildings are being sold as part of the, DI dis the ID district. Um, and there's two points I wanted to make about that. I think I would argue that the services of DDI funded by the bid, that without those services and without the public support funded by the property taxes of all the residents of Durham, that this project would not be happening and that therefore the sale prices of these buildings would be quite a bit lower. So I don't think that we could reasonably argue that measurement hasn't benefited from the economic development services of the bid either. And as the properties are about to be transferred, um, I was hoping that if the, new, if the new owners for the property were present, if they would be willing to tell us about their plans and desires for the area and whether they would support the bid going forward. Um, I believe the transfer of the property is um, happening very soon, and I think hearing from the new owners would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for having us. Um, Jessica Brock, Longfellow Real Estate Partners, and we um, are the developers of the downtown uh, Durham. Inc. The, the transfer of the property that is currently under construction has already happened. Um, so we are now the current owners of that project along with a couple others in downtown Durham. Um, we do support the bid. We will continue to support the bid. Um, we believe that the influences of downtown Durham were instrumental in helping us get that project um, out of the ground and ultimately successful. And we also believe that the downtown needs a two and a five and a 10 year long-term strategy focused on downtown. Thank you. Um, so, so the properties that we're talking about now, are some of those no longer owned by measurement or are those all owned by measurement? They're all and owned by measurement. They're all owned by measurement. But some of those are also part of the ID. They're gonna be transferred in phase two and phase three. Okay, thanks. Are there other recognized council remarks? Yes, I was gonna I was gonna start by asking um, Mr. Baker, um, we've we've heard the attorney for uh, MI properties characterize the statute and now we've heard council member Johnson characterize the statute or and, and read it. But I haven't heard anything from the city attorney's office on what the council should be or not should be doing or what we should be taking into account here. And I would love to have a little of your guidance. So our, our guidance was included in the memo, um, which includes the statutory language. Now we didn't right. set it out specifically, um, but but I will read, it's just a couple of sentences and it, and it certainly uh, goes along with Councilwoman Johnson's uh, statement. Uh, if the city council finds that the tract or parcel is not in need of services, facilities, or functions of the district to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city, the city council may, by ordinance, redefine the service district by removing therefrom the tract or parcel. So that is, she was essentially reading verbatim what the statute says. Okay, so and I would take it then that what, what I heard Mr. Bryant say is that somewhat like Johnny Cochran, if the glove don't fit, you gotta remove it from the district. And I'm hearing that the language in the statute and what you're saying is, that's not the way it's written. That's, that's correct. The, the, the city council retains the discretion. Um, it's, it's a new statute. Um, I would say that it's not as, I wouldn't have written it this way if, if that's what I was trying to, uh, uh, to, to accomplish, but, but the, the statute, as I've read it, says that, that if you 
find if you make the finding uh, that that's been presented by uh, Measurement Inc. or the, or the proponents here, the City Council may right. by ordinance. The um, thank you. Um, and so I wanted to say that um, in looking at the map of MI properties, I mean it's clear that um, that uh, MI and Dr. Sherrick have been acquiring properties whenever. It seems like, I'll say, whenever possible. I was particularly struck by 711 and 715 Washington, which are small properties and remote from their campus. And, um, and it, it just strikes me that MI has, has seen the values, the property values in downtown increasing in value. And, um, and, that, and they're, that, that at this point, they're trying to divorce that from the bid and the impacts of the bid. And then the second thing is, is that there, the argument is being made that, that um, because of the state of their properties compared to properties in other parts of the city, that the, that the services being rendered aren't necessary when it would seem like those services would be having the very impacts that they're illustrating. If they have, if there's uh, weeds and trash in other parts of the city and not where the bid is in operation, then it would seem that there would be some impacts logically from providing the services within the bid. And then I, I find it really hard to separate out for myself, what would the, um, what would it be like? I, I realize that MI is making the case we've got a big staff and we can do all this ourselves, but they're arguing that that the state of the properties is um, that it. I, I have a hard time separating out what the state of the properties would be without the services that are being offered. In other words, they're trying to point to the state of the properties as they are with the services being rendered, which is different than saying what they would be without the services. So I'm, I have, and then I heard a major downtown property owner saying that this is somewhat different than the case that MI is making, but that the that the value that property owners in downtown have, particularly large property owners, particularly large property owners who act as landlords, um, that they're getting 10 times the value returned to them in terms of in, uh, increased rents. And so, um, so far, I remain unconvinced that uh, MI is not benefiting from the services being offered uh, within the bid. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Recognize Councilman Shula. Yeah, I'm, I'm a closer, but I was trying to. No one else is speaking in the public. I'll close the public hearing and matters back before the council. Recognize Councilman Shula. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I do have a few comments. I want to first of all say that uh, when Mr. Sherrick said that he was going to offer a hug to Alice Sharp, I would just say, sir, that you picked the easy case. Mm -hmm. There's some of the people in this room that are not as, uh, probably not as friendly as Alice, and, you know, so I hope we'll all be hugging afterwards, but, you know, pick a harder case. Um, I also want to say, uh, seriously, uh, to uh, your attorney, Mr. Bryan, I have uh, said this to you uh, privately before, but I just want to say, having nothing to do with this, that you have most recently offered our community a very, very exemplary public service, uh, chairing our Board of Elections in, let's just say, an incredibly difficult time, and did so, uh, and you brought honor to yourself and to Durham. Uh, and so I've been uh, hoping to have an opportunity to say that around other people and just want to say that tonight. Um, but I don't agree with you. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think my problem with your case is that the definition of um, of the services offered so narrowly as 
the service is offered directly outside my building on the sidewalk. I think that the folks that have made the case and my colleagues, I think, have done so very well, uh, but also uh, other people who have spoken tonight uh, particularly well, I think, that MI needs these overall services for the support of its assets to a demonstrably greater extent than the rest of the city, um, not because of the particular sweeping that goes on outside of your buildings, uh, but because uh, the, the small businesses and the restaurants and uh, all of the other businesses that are in downtown that are also receiving these services um, are making the value of your assets rise. And the, the bid is necessary for this. And, um, you know, the festivals, the restaurants, the small businesses that receive these services, I think, is, is a more kind of accurate way to think about what the values of these services are than do they occur, than the ones that occur particularly outside of your business. So those are my thoughts. And um, I'm, again, uh, I, don't, I, I don't see myself supporting removing the buildings from the bid. I think my last statement I'll make is, I do think it's a very legitimate concern um, whether or not, you know, it's certainly up for debate whether or not we ought to have a bid, you know, that whether or not we tax businesses for this is, you know, or people, not just businesses, people in this area for the bid is certainly very much up for debate. I think, you know, I think we're doing the right thing, but I do think that's legitimate. Um, a very, that's a very, very um, legitimate uh, debate. I just don't think that in this case, Taking these business, you know, taking these buildings out makes sense given the, given the fact that I do think the benefits are great and demonstrably greater uh, than uh, than to the the rest of the city. So thank you. For for me, um, fortunately, the way government operates is that taxpayers don't have much of a choice in terms of what they pay for and don't pay for. I mean, we subsidize the bus system. I dare say probably very few people, uh, given the total population, use the bus system. But we subsidize with their taxes. And they don't have a choice of saying, well, don't use my tax to pay for the bus because I don't use it. Uh, we sponsor swimming pools. Uh, people live in homeowners associations where they have their own pools. They don't need the pools that, that we sponsor, but they don't have the luxury of saying, don't use my taxes to pay for those, those pools. Uh, the city was able to define what we call downtown Durham. I mean, that was in the realm of what this body legislative can do. We can define the limits of what we want to call downtown Durham. We've done that. And as a part of that, uh, we made the decision to invest through partnerships and et cetera, to help for the renovation and redevelopment of downtown Durham. I mean, that's, but not for that. A lot of these things wouldn't be happening. I mean, we've had to have the public sector to come in. We've had to have the private sector to come in. But we've, we've created those partnerships that have allowed what we call downtown Durham uh, to, to flourish. And we didn't go in and say, well, your building might be in downtown Durham, but we're going to take it out. It just so happens you happen to have a building that was in the area that we call downtown Durham. And I think personally that all the buildings that are in downtown Durham have benefited from the investments that the city has made, that other private sectors have made, that you've made, to include the benefits of the bid. I mean, if you didn't have the bid and you didn't have these persons cleaning up outside of your properties, what would downtown Durham look like? Uh, we, we, we've seen what, what the difference is here. So I, I just don't feel based on what we've done, based on what we define, based on the fact that you can't pick and choose how you want your taxes to be spent. It's no different than the bid. Uh, I propose early on in one of my state of city addresses that I think it had come a time where we needed to have a business investment district. And I felt that way at that time. I still feel that. We might argue 
is the tax rate right? And I've had those kind of arguments. We might argue whether or not the blue shirts are doing as much as they should be doing. We can continue to have those arguments. But to say that once we define what is downtown, once we've made the investment in downtown, that suddenly you say you don't want to be a part. And I'm not knocking Hank. I mean, I, I like Hank too, so we know this isn't personal. It could be anybody else that came to us with that same type of an argument. That I'm in downtown. I don't like the services that you're providing, so therefore I want to get out of it. And it just doesn't work that way, at least from my perspective, based on what we've done. So I, I would not be in support of not just this organization saying, I want to be removed. Anybody else that was in this area, we could find it's downtown. You came to this board and now say, Ops, I want to get out of it, based on whatever you have, and we've already made the investments to move, move downtown to where it is. I, I would be in opposition to it. Uh, so I recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you. I just had a question for the city attorney. Um, my reading of the memo indicates that um, that we're required to hold the public hearing, which we've done. The mayor's closed. Is that correct? Is that right? And that we have therefore discharged our responsibilities under this agenda item, assuming no other motion is made. Is that correct? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, we are. I, I'm I, good am, at that. I am struggling with what you're supposed to do next if you don't want to move forward. I know what to do if you wanted to exempt parts or all of the requested parcels out. Um, and um, I don't know, Fred, if you, I, I know that the language here specifies um, things not being in need of services or facilities or functions to a demonstrably greater extent than the city, but with the, the the discretionary language uh, that, of, of the May in there, do they even have to find that if they don't want to go forward? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there is, I think this uh, goes back to uh, Mr. Moffitt's original question, do we have to right. act? The recommendation in the, by staff um, under number two is that you do make a finding, but that, that none of the properties uh, should be, um, that in the negative that the uh, properties um, do need the services to a demonstrably greater extent than uh, than the others, and that's why you have worded that way with a none um, at the end. If you choose to identify individual one or more properties, then you fill that blank in. But the statute, the actual wording of the statute, if I if if I could read it, the operable language is: Upon receipt of the request from the property owner, the city council shall hold a public hearing as required by subsection A, which we've done, um, of the section, if, if the city council finds that the tract or parcel is not in need of the services, facilities, or functions of the district to a demonstrably greater extent than the remainder of the city, the city council may, by ordinance, redefine the district, the service district, by removing therefrom the tract or parcel. You'll notice it says, if the council finds. Well, what if you don't find one way or another, does it say you must make a finding? There's nothing in here that says there must be a finding of X, Y, or Z. So, uh, so uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to the question. I think that's something that might be up to uh, the judiciary. Um, but uh, the, rec the recommendation, at least from council, is uh, from, the, mm -hmm. from the staff is, is the uh, uh, motion number two. What if, what if we what if we took no action and adjourned the meeting? I, I don't I don't think the statute requires you to take an action. Well, I, I'm I'm asking what if we yeah. took no action and just adjourned the meeting? I think that I think that answers the question that's okay. couched in this. Fred, if you have no, I don't. I, um, it doesn't say that you have to take an action. It yeah. says if you find, then you may take an action. Um, so. I don't, I don't have an answer for you. Can I have it? Recognize, recognize Councilman Davis and then Councilman Schultz. Move we adjourn the meeting. Second. It's been properly moved for a second. Is a further question or discussion? And I'm gonna call a question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote.
passes seven to zero. Thank you. Any further items to come before the council? Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you for it's staying not with us. Adjourn at ten or seven p.m. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.